Thanks. All right, welcome everyone. It is uh, December 18th, and we're um, at our last business meeting of the year. It is, we are at the Southern Human Services Center, and this um, meeting is actually a special meeting because it is um, a makeup for our meeting on December 11th. Uh, with that being said, we cannot change anything on the agenda, so I'm just going to skip that part and just move right on to the regular agenda. Um, at our places tonight, we have uh, a County Board of Elections um, PowerPoint, and there's some stuff from two, two reports from uh, the Finance Department. Um, and I believe that is it. Everybody should have those. Um, so, are we having our arts moment tonight? Mm -hmm. Tinka, join us. Mm -hmm. We are. Oh, Tinka, I'm sorry. Please join us. Yeah. I am pleased to introduce Michael Chitwood. It's the most recent collection. Tika, can you put that down to your... Okay. Thank you. There. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Now we can. Hi. Yeah. I'm very pleased to in introduce Michael Chitwood. Um, his most recent collection, Search and Rescue, received the 2018 L.A. Fillenbaum Prize from Louisiana State University Press. His work has appeared in The Atlantic, The New Republic, Oxford American, The Southern Review, and numerous other journals, as well as on Garrison Keillor's The Writer's Almanac. He teaches at the University of North Carolina. Michael Chitwood. Good evening. Good evening. And thanks for inviting me here tonight. Uh, I'm going to read a poem that's called The All Bikini <coughs> Atoll Marching Band and Mount Rushmore Precision Drill Team. You know that the Bikini Atoll was where the first nuclear test was conducted, and of course you know what Mount Rushmore is. And this is a poem about how language and nostalgia are being used these days. The All Bikini Atoll Marching Band and Mount Rushmore Precision Drill Team. Motion to have a parade approved. And yes, let's ratify a constitutional amendment to make the country what it once was in the future. Let's say TV didn't become a dinosaur, but was responsible for dinner, and we bought gas and a loaf of bread without locking our doors. And what about respect? There was a housewife in every garage. Yes, let's marry in proper pairs. Let's say a prayer for victory and thank our lucky strikes. Let's keep our forest fires in our forests for the sake of future generations and give the national debt a smoky bandit smoky bear hat and uniform. Let's get some gingham and whittle a gigal that won't run from trouble. Refrigeration and a respectable haircut. In the fall, a little football wouldn't sink a ship. Let's all hold hands from out of our own pockets and stand up to get down on our knees. Let's say the good old car the good old brand new car was coming around the mountain when a home run and a handshake would still get you an honest day's day in the park with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, okay, we're going to move on to public comment now. Um, <clears throat> when I call your name, if you would come up to the microphone, you'll have three minutes to speak. And this is for matters that are not on the printed agenda. Let's start with uh, Riley Rusky, please, and followed by Robin Jacobs. <clears throat> Thank you and good evening. Good evening. My name is Riley Rusky. I'm a United States citizen and a veteran. Almost 50 years ago, I took an oath of office to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic that it would bear true faith and allegiance to the same. My sense of duty and patriotism is renewed every time I hear newly elected county commissioners take the oath of office to support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina not inconsistent therewith. Inherent in both oaths is the duty to protect and preserve the sovereignty of the United States of America. It is also my hope, strong hope that these officials make this oath with a true commitment of their hearts and minds and not just as a minor formality to take office. There's been a lot of talk in recent years about foreign influence in our elections and governance. 
Most of this talk expresses outrage about foreign nation states such as Russia, China, North Korea, and others. Our Congress and special counsels conduct politicized hearings and investigations into these activities, but it's really just pathetic and dangerous political posturing. The United States government has interfered in foreign elections and governance for decades, from Radio Free Europe to funding of resistance dissident groups to imposing sanctions to putting in place leaders like Noriega, Castro, Hussein, and others. It is only to be expected that other nation states would try the same things against the United States. Many of the same members of our government who rage against interference in our country are the same ones who sit on congressional committees or in bureaucracies like the State Department and spy agencies which authorize U.S. interference in foreign governments. Their outrage is hypocritical at best and even dishonest in the presentation to the American people. Thankfully, because we still have a fairly open society, the efforts of these foreign nation states don't have much real effect. However, there is a real existential danger of foreign influence in our country. A recent Yale University study, actually Yale University and MIT joint study, shows that there are more than 20 million foreign nationals of illegal presence in our community, in our country. Not only do these illegal aliens cost the United States citizen taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars each year, they exert incredible influence in our elections and governance at all levels. They actually distort the allocation of members of the House of Congress, our House of Representatives in our Congress, thereby depriving our own citizens of their rightful representation in government. We've seen political candidates pledge everything from amnesty to citizenship to these illegal aliens as part of their campaigns to win office. A recent past president even basically gave two million of them amnesty after stating multiple times he could not legally do so. Some government office holders are even working to give these foreign nationals the right to vote in local elections and hold office in local government. Our very own Senators Burr and Tillis and Congressman Price all, all support the illegal alien movement. I'm going to ask for a minute more to finish. Please wrap it up. Okay. Recently, the Orange County Nine, the County Manager Hammersley, County Sheriff Blackwood, and all seven commissioners, Doris and Rich Burroughs, Jacobs, Markopoulos, McKee, and Price, acted to provide U.S. citizen taxpayer funds to aid and abet, shield, and shelter illegal aliens in Orange County. Even more recently, Sheriff Blackwood put our families and children at risk by releasing convicted illegal alien child molesters into our county instead of turning them over to ICE for deportation. No doubt some people will call these comments racist or hateful. Such comments would come out of ignorance or dishonesty. National citizenship is a legal identification of affiliation or allegiance to a nation state. Thank you, Mr. Ruski. Thank you. You've had your time. Thank you. Robin Jacobs. Good evening, everyone. Good I'm evening. Ro <laughs> I'm Robin Jacobs. I'm the executive director of the Eno River Association, and I'm here tonight to bring you greetings from the association and um, to present you and the county with copies of the 2019 Eno River Association calendar. Um, this year's calendar celebrates and documents um, things that have been left behind by the people who lived along the Eno River here in Orange County and in Durham County. And um, I, this is one of the most fun things I get to do every year is to come and bring you greetings. Um, it's such a pleasure, but it also means a lot because the county and the Eno River Association have a really great partnership working together. We're protecting natural areas along the river for wildlife, for people to <laughs> use, and, um, and local family farms. Um, so we really appreciate the work that we do with you, and thank you very much. Thank you. I look and forward to this every year. If it's okay with you, I'll bring these up. Sure, that would be fine. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Sure. Thank you, my guys. Happy holidays. Yeah. Thanks. Can't stay away. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thanks, Robert. Yeah. Okay, next up is Bill Ward, please. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I'm Bill Ward, and I'm a, I guess I'll call myself a green activist here in North, in Orange County. And I'm here to petition you to comment on Duke Energy Carolina's latest integrated resource plan that they submitted in early um, September, and you have 150 days, I understand, to submit comments. 
and I believe through a separate communication, I identified to you the ways in which you can do this. Because um, currently, Duke Energy Carolina is importing over a billion dollars worth of carbon fuels to generate electricity in our county, or for the state. And I want to give you some idea of what's happening in other communities in the country, and then give you a little better idea of what Duke is doing. Monterey Bay Community Power, three counties in California, currently are 100% carbon free. Warren Buffett's Mid-America by 2020 with 100% wind will be carbon free. Green Mountain in Vermont, uh, saw on their website today that they're 90% carbon free. I was impressed because they were only required to be 60% carbon free by the renewable energy portfolio standard that was the law in Vermont. So she said, oh, that was apropos that you called me. We were just trying to set our date when we're going to be 100% carbon free. And also in Washington, D.C., it came out today on the, uh, on the news that they're going to committing to be 100% carbon free by 2032. <coughs> now that compares with Duke Energy that's talking about using coal-fired plants into the 2040s. And one way of getting a measure on how dirty Duke's power is is th through what they call an emissions factor. And currently Duke's emissions factor is at 0.7 pounds carbon dioxide for each kilowatt hour of electricity they generate. Now a typical family or a typical household uses about 100,000 kilowatt or 1,000 kilowatt hours per month. So that would be 500 pounds of carbon dioxide. Now if you imagine if these people had to uh, cart 50, uh, 500 pounds every month out to the street to take care of it and dispose of it, because that's essentially what carbon dioxide is. It's a waste gas from electricity generation. And now that would potentially fall on something like the county at a 0 .5, uh, 0 .5 or at one half pound carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour would mean that the county would have to dispose of 300,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year. So that's why I'm hoping that you'll partition the, uh, or I'll petition you to comment to Duke about their energy plan and to make it greener than it currently is. Thank you, Mr. Ward. The, the way that petitions work is we'll take that back, back to agenda review and then we'll respond to you within the next uh, meeting. This is somewhat time sensitive, 150 days, you said, from? Well, yeah, that's what I, officially, that's what I've read. Okay. And Cassie, uh, who is one of the legislative interfaces for the Sierra Club, suggested it's a little January, February. She was a little iffier about when you actually had to submit the comments. Okay, we'll, we'll get a response back to you. Thank you so much. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. Um, and then I have Craig Carter. Thank you, Ms. Penny. Uh, I asked you last at the meeting at the Widdett Building about the memorial flag for veterans, that it uh, comes four foot by nine foot six, and some veterans wanted to fly. We just buried a veteran who wanted to fly in the cemetery. And you said you would write me a letter and let me know what the response was. I'm just telling you, I ain't got no response. And I say, my parents served Orange County for 31 years, Department of Aging. They worked in that, and they also helped start the Durham Rescue Mission. And they had a flag flown over. The White House was giving their honor. I can't fly it no more because it's too big. And also, I'd like to talk to you about getting more ambulance service to the northern part of the county, that's my biggest gripe. I mean, flag is no big issue with somebody's life at stake. But we just had a lady that died in our church and she lived 1.8 miles from your 911 center over at Meadowlands. Well, I drove that in a minute and 45 seconds. She laid over there for eight and a half minutes with no oxygen. And a lot of people don't know that our volunteer fire department can't give you any medicine, can't start an airway, can't do nothing for you as a medic. We need paramedics. <coughs> And a lot of people don't know that about the fire department. They can't really do any help to you. And I said that I've called 911 twice at my house. I had a dude shooting a gun in the state park. My 911 system went to Durham County. Then I had to get transferred back to Orange County. 
then they told me they couldn't talk to the state park. And I'm the farthest house north on the Eno River State Park. And finally a park <laughs> ranger called me back and told me she couldn't come back there because she's by herself. Well, the county didn't even send a deputy sheriff to check on my wife and children. You know, they're at the house. There's a guy shooting a gun in the state park. So I would like for y'all to look into that. And when the girl was lost in the state park, she was hauling for help. We dialed 911 said she's 300 feet west of our house. Nobody never showed up. No response. No response from the county at all. And since we spent $800,000 on the fire station out there on St. Mary's Road, why can't we station an ambulance there? And the snow we had, nobody even shoveled the snow off the parking lot or pl plowed it off the parking lot. The ambulance sat there during Florence. Y'all moved them from Florence from Phelps Road because that building's not safe. And you put them on St. Mary's Road and the ambulance didn't have a plug to plug in to keep it the refrigeration and everything in the ambulance that has to be done. So the ambulance sat outside waiting for the hurricane and the motor has to stay running because there ain't no plug. I think it should be a plug at all fire stations and in all schools for the ambulance to have to plug up an emergency. At least two plugs at each school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Chair Rich, if I might respond. Sure. Uh, I, I know we normally do not respond to uh, public comments, but since this does involve public services, the, I do not believe the ambulances, the, the response time from Meadowland to uh, the house that you speak of, uh, the norm, ambulances are, normally are not at the Meadowlands. They are stationed on various areas in the county and they could have been quite a ways away. I'm not making an excuse, I'm just clarifying that. Um, the situation with uh, the St. Mary's uh, Road uh, fire station, I believe that an ambulance is at that station at least part time. I'm not exactly sure, but I can follow up on that and we can have uh, emergency services follow up on that. Thank you. There is no ambulance station there, period. I live there. I go by it all the time. We, we can verify. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank you all. Um, does anyone want to speak to something that is not on the printed agenda? Okay, great. Let's move on to announcements by um, board members, and we'll start with you, Mr. Uh, Chair McKee, please. Chair McKee. <laughs> Commissioner McKee. I'll get it right. I'll answer to anything. There you go. Um, yes, in the meeting, the first meeting that we had two weeks ago, I mentioned that I would like to have a report back uh, from Go Triangle on changes and different issues that have came up. Uh, that is even more critical now uh, with the news that it's a proposed a tunneling under a part of Durham uh, and with no cost figure attached. I would now pr uh, petition that Go Triangle be asked to come and make a presentation on changes both to the uh, parameters of the project uh, for light rail as well as the updated cost on that at our first meeting of the year in January. Yes, I have two quick things. One, I just want to remind folks that on Sunday the 21st in Hillsborough is the annual lantern walk. You are uh, invited to bring your own lantern and um, you need to meet at the, um, um, where do they meet? Uh, the, um, at the Riverwalk in Hills, Hillsborough is free, but you need to go to their website and register, and that's <laughs> www.hillsboroughartscouncil.org, and then you'll find a link from there. Uh, it's a lovely annual tradition. I encourage you to, to go. And then the second quick thing is I want to send a congratulations to Carly Wheelis of Hillsborough for being a finalist in a contest for National Horse Trainer of the Year. There were 20 selected as finalists, including some who had been training horses for a very long time. Carly is 16 years old. She got into training by accident. She decided she wanted a horse of her own, and so she selected a pony, and her family went to pick it out, and they picked one who seemed calm and gentle and, uh, you know, just, just, just dandy. Uh, and they got him home, and a few days later, the, the horse turned mean, incredibly mean and untrained. Apparently, the horse had been drugged for the presentation. Uh, but she didn't give up. She turned herself into a, uh, a trainer practicing a, a strategy called natural horsemanship, which is a humane way to train horses. It involves... Um, working with uh, body motions and there's no force involved and now she's really gotten into training. I think Carly Willis is a young woman to watch and I'd like encourage all of us to congratulate her. Thank you. Commissioner <coughs> Dorson. 
Yes, thank you. Um, on Friday, I attended, along with Commissioner Green, the Justice Advisory Council meeting, and we got a presentation from Assistant District Attorney Jeff Neiman and also uh, Daniel Bose, who's a lawyer with the North Carolina Justice Center, on um, a project that they've been working on for a long time regarding um, driver's license restoration and the elimination of traffic court debt. Um, and there's a program, uh, there's a sort of pilot program going on in Durham. Orange County's had its own um, uh, program at a much lower level um, that's doing really incredible anti-poverty work by helping people get their licenses restored um, who've mainly lost them because they can't pay the, the fines and fees. It's really the criminalization of poverty. And during the presentation, we learned that um, Durham uh, recently funded a, pro, a pilot program for $270,000 there that added um, four lawyers specifically to work on these issues. Um, and I would be interested in the county, in Orange County, um, creating a, you know, funding a similar program. I talked with Jeff and Daniel and also Kate Finhagen um, given the size and nature of the issue in Orange County, I don't think it, we would need as significant a commitment. Probably, uh, um, you know, Kate and we can get more specifics, but estimated the equivalent of one full-time, you know, attorney who could be housed in either John Roberts' office or in the CJRD office um, that could be dedicated to this. I know we're not at budget season yet, but it's something that I'd like to just put on the board's radar that I'll certainly be asking for when we get to that. And I think um, we could also get, if, if the board would be interested, we could have a version of the presentation that we saw at that, um, at that committee meeting. I think it would, it's really enlightening and it's really a tremendous, a significant impact it can make on the lives of, of people and on the safety in the community. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to bring up is I was contacted by a resident um, recently about um, about the use of gray water, um, which is you know water from washing dishes or showers, which the county currently requires it to be processed just like what they call black water, which is sewage, you know, um, like wastewater from your toilets. Um, that's a requirement that the county imposes. It's not a state requirement. The state has regs that say gray water can be recycled for home use, could be used for flushing toilets, or for irrigation purposes. And so given um, you know, our critical water needs, a lot of which is dedicated to people watering their lawns and, and uh, outdoor uses, um, I'd like to see if we could get some information from OWASA or our OWASA reps about the possibility of the use of gray water in the county, particularly for potentially for irrigation, given our large agricultural population. So I could just reply to that real quick. Sure. When I was on the OWASA board, we actually did uh, work with uh, UNC to put in the purple pipes, which is the gray water. So a lot of what you see for the cooler, the chiller plants and the and the. Um, uh, uh, you know, the grass and the, the, the fields out there, yeah, the, the golf course spelling. is all coming from gray water. So maybe out in the county we don't do it, but Owasa does do it, but we can certainly get a report um, that could, could follow up on that. Okay, great. So it, it is an action. I, it, might not be, it, it might not be as extensive as, as the resident thinks because it, we were in partnership with UNC. Right. So it had to be wor working with UNC. Well, if we could just get some information yep. about the possibility of Absolutely. expanding that. I figured you Owasa types would know that off the top of your head. <laughs> Commissioner Price. Uh, yes, first uh, is actually a question. Um, do we have plans regarding the Pat Sanford Award for that to come before this board? From the animal services? Um, I know we initiated that award, but I know that they made a selection, and I was just wondering, um, is, will that be presented here? I will check into that and okay. get back to the board on that. I think that the Pants, Pat Sanford grant is awarded, but I don't know that it comes forward to the board. I think okay. it was initiated and introduced, but I think it's done. But I'll get back to okay. the board on that. All right. Um, I'd also like to, uh, I have three, uh, three petitions. Uh, one is a resolution or a proclamation honoring Nate Davis. Uh, he's retired after 48 years working for the town of Chapel Hill, but he's also been quite an activist in the county. I know I first met him on the Human Relations Commission way back in the 90s. So that's my first petition. 
Uh, the second um, is to recognize the senior um, uh, seniors at Orange High School in, who are in the Future Farmers of America team. And they won the highest state honor and they're going on to the national championship or competition. And I was gonna ask uh, Commissioner McKee if he wanted to say anything more on that, on the significance. Yes, we uh, quite often recognize ball teams for uh, yeah. their accomplishments. And I think that given the fact that this AFFA uh, organization uh, does a lot to encourage and promote folks to be responsible and to grow into not just agriculture fields, but all, all types of uh, yeah. employment. So yes, I would heartily endorse that. Yeah, yeah um, they do train them to be leaders. And uh, the last one is that I received an email uh, regarding the ABC board and the state. Um, there's a possibility at the state level to privatize uh, alcoholic beverage sales, and uh, I would like to petition this board to sign on to a petition that that not happen. And it just so happens also that uh, last week at the board of directors meeting for the National uh, North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, that they also worked on a legislative goal to oppose privatization of um, sale of alcoholic beverages. And that's it. Thank you, Commissioner Bedford. Pass, thank you. So at our first meeting in December, I proposed that we pass a resolution urging Representative David Price to support the Green New Deal. And the intention was to bring that back at our next meeting. The next meeting was gonna be a week later and there wasn't much time. So I just wanna let everybody know that I'm gonna, I'm gonna write it and circulate it to everyone so we can be prepared to deal with it in January, which will still be timely. Thanks. And I just have um, just a few things. Um, if we could get some updates, one about the Hillsborough train station, there was a, a, an article in the uh, News of Orange. It would be nice to know what the status of that is. I don't know whether that has to come as a report to us, but it would be nice to hear where we are with that. Um, and then also um, with the Wegman site, you can see that happening, but we never really f got a follow through from the town of Chapel Hill of how, that, how the Wegmans changed. <laughs> I know that, that the, incent the incentives are all based on performance, but it'd be nice to know overall how that space is go going to change and look differently um, for us. And those are my two. And lastly, at the last meeting I was going to um, it was the last day of Hanukkah. I was going to wish everyone a happy Hanukkah, but we didn't have a meeting. So I just wanted to take that time to wish everyone a happy Hanukkah now, a day late, and hope everyone had <coughs> lots of lakas. And um, Commissioner Dorson, is it apple or sour cream? What do you What do you think? I just right out of the pan, salt. It's, that's it. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. That's a, a purist. <laughs> it's a purist. Yeah. Commissioner Markopoulos. I just add a question to the train station issue. Uh -huh. In In that article. Um, the Margaret Howth, the planner for Hillsborough, was quoted as saying that they had five years in which to figure out how to design the building and there was plenty of time to get it the way they wanted it. And I'd like to have that clarified what their schedule actually is because it would be great to get that station up and running as soon as reasonably possible. That was kind of my reasoning for asking for, for yeah. an, an update because I, I don't know that we've, ever, we've seen anything um, for a while on that, so. Um, right. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's move on, on to four um, proclamations, uh, resolutions, and special presentations. And we're gonna start with um, our Board of Elections, Ms. Rachel Raper, and she's gonna provide a follow-up on the November 6, 2018 election um, that was held in Orange County. And we all have that PowerPoint presentation to follow along. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So again, thank you for having me. I can say that um, the election cycles of 2018 were filled with interest and intrigue. We had, it seemed like, near constant litigation, legislation. We had two hurricanes hit during crucial times, one right before absentee voting by mail started, <coughs> the other the day before the voter registration deadline. Uh, we had a temporary relocation of our office, and we had an Owasa water main break the day before the election. 
However, with all that swirling around us, we were still able to timely complete all of our pre-election tasks, that, and that includes uh, campaign auditing campaign finance reports, 41 to be exact. We did thorough logic and accuracy testing on all of our equipment. We trained over 240 election officials over the course of 24 training sessions. We uh, got supplies ready for 44 precincts, five one-stop voting sites. And we uh, certified and trained our multi-partisan assistance teams, and those are the teams that are deployed to assisted living facilities as requested to assist voters in requesting and completing absentee ballots. We also, during July 1 through November 6, we processed over 7,000 new registrations. We processed almost 5,000 duplicate registrations, and we processed um, 5,700 uh, voter changes. During, we also removed over 5,195 uh, 5, voters from voter rolls due to registration activity elsewhere, death reports, fel felony sentencing reports, um, or requests from voters. So we completed list maintenance projects as well during that time. And so in that four month time between July and November, we processed and sent over 17,000 voter cards that we mailed to voters. So it's an incredible time of registration activity. Um, after uh, the, st the start of absentee by mail uh, was delayed, as I said, we had a hurricane coupled with litigation surrounding the language of the constitutional amendment. So that did delay absentee voting by mail by a few days. It was to start on a Friday and we were able to start mailing ballots the following Tuesday. Um, we processed and mailed out 2,865 absentee ballots. Of those returned, that represented 3% of our total voter registration turnout which is a lot higher than it's been in the past. So we did have a really good absentee by mail response. Right before the start of our early one-stop voting, there was legislation that mandated our hours during the week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. If, if our office was gonna offer early voting hours beyond just your office and your normal business hours. And as directed by the bipartisan state board of elections and ethics enforcement, we did, um, we established five early voting sites and we had a cumulative total of 905 early voting hours. As you see, we had, of our total turnout, 64 uh, voted early in person. We had 43,253 voters who took advantage of those extended hours and our one-stop um, plan. As you can see, Carborough Town Hall led the pack with a little over 11,000 voting at Carborough Town Hall. They were followed by the Seymour Senior Center, the lovely Seymour Senior Center, where we had uh, 10,656, followed closely by our office in Hillsboro with 10,197, then Chapel of the Cross in uh, Chapel Hill. We had 7,869 vote there. And then the Eflin Ruritan Club, we had 3,152 vote there. So again, a total of 43,253 voters voted um, during that one-stop early voting period. Now, this next slide just shows the, the spike, as always. I think this could be a slide for any sort of deadline. You see that spike right at the end where people wait until right before early voting ends to vote. Um, and I've broken down by day. We started October 17th, a Wednesday, and we voted every, every single day until November 3rd. This slide doesn't really tell the whole story because this shows the spikes at the weekend. Um, this is one-stop voters per hour per day. So this is how many people voted per hour per day at all sites. And like I said, you can really see those spikes um, on the weekend, which is there's a weekend, there's a weekend, and then the last two days of early voting. And so again, early voting was, uh, there was a great response to our early voting um, schedule and hours. And then 
On election day, we had 33 people who vote, 33 percent of our voters, so um, a little over 22,000 voted on election day. Polls were open 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. As I've said, in keeping with the spirit of an interesting election season, the Wassa water main broke the day before the election, which effectively shut down a lot of both Carborough and Chapel Hill during a time when my U-Haul trucks were en route to set up precincts the Monday before the election. Judges were en route to set up their precinct. So that certainly took a lot uh, more logistical planning, begging facilities to please stay open just until our equipment could, could get there. And um, I did want to thank the Asset Management Services Department. They ensured that all of the affected precincts had temporary restrooms delivered to the precinct so that my officials would have access to restrooms during that 14 plus hour days because they are not allowed to leave um, a precinct, once you get there, you have to stay. So I certainly want to thank them for that. They, they took care of that. No issues were reported. Poll books and printers worked, and all precincts opened at 6.30 a.m. as required by law. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, election day voters per hour. It was steady throughout the day. We had our usual blip in the morning, you know, morning lunch. We always have the afternoon lull. People don't vote, it seems like, on election day in the afternoon, I'm taking a lunchtime nap. Um, so we were, again, pleased by the turnout also on election day. And on election day, we did have 371 provisional ballots cast. Those are cast when a voter presents to vote and their name is not found in the poll book, so they provide our office evidence, and then we research to determine their eligibility. And of those provisional ballots cast, 124 were fully approved by the Board of Elections, five were partially approved, and 242 were not approved, the bulk being uh, we found no record of their registration or they had been previously removed because they had registration activity in other counties or states. So that is who voted or that's when people voted and how they voted. And now I just wanted to dig into the demographics a little bit. Can I ask As you a question I, before you start? Yes. That? What is a partial approvement? Those were the people who uh, presented to vote normally out of precinct, and we had that Chapel Hill um, affordable housing bond, so they presented to a precinct, got that precinct's ballot, um, and they were not eligible to vote based on their, re on their uh, registration and where they live <clears throat> on that affordable housing bond. The same thing happens with the NC House districts. We have different ballot styles, and you get the ballot when you present to a precinct, the ballot that is there, and that's not necessarily the ballot that you're entitled to. Chair Rich, I've got a follow-up. Sure. The, the song, same lines. You mentioned that quite a few people uh, had voted, but no record of their having been registered. No, um, we did not approve those provisional ballots because of uh, the. They did vote that provisional ballot, but if that ballot is not approved, it's not tabulated. R right. I mean, I understand, into, I understand yes. that, but was there any follow up as to why they thought they should vote? Did they think they were already registered, or has there been any follow up to find out? Most, why they would vote and then there's no record of their registration? Some people felt that they had registered to vote. We did not find any record of that. And then um, because Chapel Hill School was closed, we had um, some students who just went with friends to vote. I don't know that they were necessarily committed to the fact that they were absolutely registered to vote, but they're told go go present the vote, see if you're on the records. If, you not, if you're not, you can vote that provisional ballot because you're filling out that voter registration application. So you do get registered to vote after this election. So we do encourage people, if you haven't, you know, <laughs> just come vote, vote the provisional ballot, we'll research you. But you're also registered to vote for the next election. So it gets you registered to vote. Okay, thank you for your diligence. So of the six, 67,646 uh, voters who turned out to vote for this election, you can see that 52% uh, were Democrats. We had 38.5% were unaffiliated, 14.5% were Republican, and then we had the less than the other party, less than 1%, and that's Libertarian, Green Party, and the Constitution Party. Turnout by gender, females voted more than males. You can see 53 to 43, and then there's that 4% undeclared, which just means they did not select anything when they registered to vote. Then turnout by age group. There's always a lot of talk about the over 65 population being the 
the most um, committed voters. But here in Orange County, you can see that our, in this election, uh, the age group 40, 41 to 65, we had a 44% turnout. They, they represented 44% of the total voter turnout. And then turnout by race, you see 77% were white. We had the 10% black African American, 6% undeclared, 4% Asian, 2% other, and then 1% multiracial, and then less than half a percent were Indian American. And then ethnicity, we had 78% who were not Hispanic Latino, 20% undeclared, and then 2% Hispanic Latino. So now we know who voted, when they voted, and where they voted. I think the burning question is how did this turnout compare to, you know, past elections? This is a blue, we call it a blue moon election, meaning that it happens very infrequently every 12 years. It's when there, is, there are no statewide races scheduled to be on the ballot other than judicial races. So we don't have a hot Senate race or um, governor's race on the ballot. And I think it's pretty easy. Um, this goes back from 2002 to 2018. It's very easy to pick out those presidential years where we have those, those spikes in uh, turnout. But as you see in 2018, we had a 58.71% uh, of voter turnout. And again, for a midterm blue moon election, that is, I would, I'll, I'll only be delighted with 100% turnout, but for, again, this type of election, I am happy with the turnout. Our last blue moon election was 2006, and that was a 38.86% um, turnout. So, again, 58.71% um, turnout for, you know, uh, a blue moon election is, is a good one. And so, I just want to thank the board for y'all's continued support for our office. Um, because of your support, we're able to offer voters the best possible service and also opportunity. And my board thanks you, my staff thanks you, and the voters of Orange County, whether they know it or not, they thank you too. So again, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions? Commissioner Dorson. Yeah, I have a couple. Um, <clears throat> I'm just on the... Uh, do you, do you have, and if you don't have it at hand, can you find out for us, um, of those 42,000-something voters who voted early, um, do we know how many uh, voters were registered during that period, since that's when same-day registration? Yes, we had um, 1,776 people took part in that same-day voter registration process, and a little over 24,000. 2,154 updated an address or a name during that time period. So 1776, that number sticks out. So they, those were our new registrants during that one-stop time period. And th this is a great report, but a little bit of the information is, uh, I mean, is, um, I mean, I, I'd be interested in some different information. So like the turnout by age group slide and the turnout by race slide, you took all everybody who voted and figured out what percentage of each group voted. But what's, what's more interesting to me, I think, is not how many of everybody who voted was over 65, but of everybody who is registered who's over 65. In other words, how did the over 65 group fare compared to the 18 to 25 group, like, do, you know what I mean? Yes, the demographics, um, I have done that. I don't have that with me tonight, but I do have that information. And the demographics really mirror are the registration demographics. Um, we have 38% um, are registered to vote in that 41 to 65. So 38% of those who are 41 to 65 are registered to vote. Of that, 44% turned out to vote, if that that uh, clarifies anything, but everything but the age group almost exactly mirrored the the voter registration. So I just I just want to make sure I understand. This slide says that has the pie. Mm -hmm. So it's forty four percent of everybody who voted was right. age forty one to sixty five. Right. And you're also saying that everyone who of everyone who's registered who's age forty one to sixty five. 44% of them turned out, that seems mathematically surprising that they'd be exactly the same. It's actually 38% of our registration population are 41 to 60, uh, 65. So of the 38% registered, 44% of those turned out. Well, 
it, I, it, I would like if you can provide mm -hmm. the number, right? Yes. So how many voters are there in that category? And then how, I mean, in other words, you're saying only 21%, this shows, you're saying only 21% of the registered voters over 65 turned out? No, that is 21% of those who registered to vote or who turned out were that age group. Right, so what I want to know is, of all the registered voters in that age group, mm -hmm. how, what percentage of those voters turned out? Okay, and yes, it, and that's certainly something, a report I can, yeah. you know. Yeah, do you understand what I'm saying, yes, though? Yes, so I do now, yes. Because so, it's not, you know, that's the comparison that we want to know, is like, who, are we missing big gra gaps in any of these demographics that we need, want to do more targeted outreach to? Right. And same thing with the race. Right, so 70%, 77% of the, all the voters were white, but of all the white registered voters, what percentage of those actually turned out? That's, that's, the, that's the more valuable metric, I think. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is, so we had, we had 50 something, 58%, almost 59% total turnout. And, um, so the other thing that would be interesting to know is, so there's how many registered voters in the county altogether? 100, a little over 115,000. A little over 115,000. And do we know what percentage of the population is over 18 and eligible to vote? We're in other about, words, how good are we doing on voter registration? We have 85%. Um, I do check the planning department's website, um, and it looks like we have about 85% of the uh, population is registered to vote, which is... Um, is a good average for me. It's not too high, not too low. It, it runs about average, so it, it's not great, but it also, also doesn't put us in the lawsuit territory when we start getting close <coughs> to that 100%. And that's when um, other groups will sue us and say that we're not doing our list maintenance. Um, it's happened to other counties before. Once the voter registration exceeds the 100% of the, um, the population or people who could be registered to vote. So it would be good to just have some of those numbers somewhere so we could have some benchmarks as we're looking okay. at, you know, at, at some of this stuff. Other questions? Commissioner Price? Yes, well, first of all, I, one of my questions was what Commissioner Dorson just asked about the numbers, the actual numbers in the demographics compared to the total population. My other, uh, it was about the, the one stop voters per hour. Mm -hmm. And so, so what did you do, average those? Yes, I took the voters per day and averaged that by how many hours, how many hours we offered that day. And because Monday through Friday, it was, it was 12. Uh, we offered 12 hours. Saturdays was seven. And Sundays, we only offered two. We had the two hours. Right. And that's why the spike, I mean, yes, it looks yes. really, it look, yes. it looks very impressive, but it was, it was over a two hour, two hour period. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Additional questions? Yeah, we're all good. Thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate it. Good report, and we'll get so, those numbers back to yes. Commissioner Dorson. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we're going to move on to 4B, and that is the proclamation of the Bill of Rights Day, and this is to adopt the proclamation to officially recognize Bill of Rights Day in Orange County during the month of December. And we're going to ask Peggy Mish to come on up to the podium. <coughs> And would you, do you, did you want to read the Bill of Rights resolution? Okay, thank you, Peggy. Fancy lemon. This is the Orange County Board of Commissioners proclaim Bill of Rights Day, December 15, 2018. Whereas the necessary states ratified the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution on December 15, 1791, and whereas the Bill of Rights protects every person of this state and nation from the infringement of basic human and civil rights and whereas the freedoms of speech and association and the right 
to due process and equal protection of the law as embedded in the Bill of Rights are a model for democratic <coughs> institutions and laws all over the world. And whereas it was the North Carolina Convention held in Pittsburgh, excuse me, in Hillsborough, in Hillsborough, which was instrumental regarding the inclusion of the Bill of Rights as part of ratifying the United States Constitution, and whereas the people of North Carolina stood strong in withholding ratification of the Constitution until the Bill of Rights was added to ensure their inalienable rights, and whereas the North Carolina Board of Commissioners demonstrated its commitment to upholding civil rights and civil liberties of all persons in Orange County and their free exercise and enjoyment of any and all rights and privileges secured by our <coughs> constitutions and laws of the United States, the state of North Carolina and Orange County in a May 20, 2003 <coughs> approved resolution entitled A Resolution Regarding the Protection of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties and whereas the Orange County Board of Commissioners reaffirmed the protections of all its residents by passing a resolution opposing the use of local law enforcement to enforce civil immigration law and policy. On January 23rd, 2007, now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Orange County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim December 15, 2018, as Bill of Rights Day in Orange County and commend this observance to all people. This, the 18th day of December, 2018. So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and that passes. Thank you, Peggy. You could just stay right there. We're going to move on to 4C, which is a resolution in support of the campaign to make North Carolina a non-torture state. And this is to consider a resolution in support of uh, the, to make North Carolina a non-torture state. And I've asked Commissioner Green to read that resolution. Um, Chair Rich, would we like for uh, Peggy to say, give a little bit of context for it? Uh, she said she would like to speak afterwards. After, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great. Whereas the non-governmental North Carolina Commission of Inquiry on Torture was established to examine the role of North Carolina in the United States secret global torture program launched soon after September 11, 2011, and whereas the volunteer-led NCCIT has conducted an inquiry into the use of public airports by the CIA to facilitate torture and learned that Aero Contractors, a CIA-affiliated company, transported at least 49 people for torture, many of them innocent of any terrorist ties. And whereas Aero Contractors is headquartered at the Johnston County Airport in Smithfield, North Carolina, and also used the state-run Global Trans Park in Kinston for the, quote, torture taxi flights. And whereas North Carolina residents have been calling since 2005 for an investigation of aero contractors, and support has come from people of faith, veterans, elected officials, civic groups, labor, various political parties, and members of different racial and ethnic groups. And whereas 10 NCCIT commissioners a diverse blue, blue ribbon panel of distinguished individuals heard testimony from 20 witnesses, survivors, journalists, human rights experts, on November 30th and December 1st, 2017 in Raleigh. And whereas Governor Roy Cooper and Attorney General Josh Stein are expected to respond to the 84-page NCCIT report since its release on October 27th, 2018, and whereas the Orange County Board of Commissioners adopted the resolution in support of the North Carolina Commission of Inquiry on Torture in December 2016, now therefore be it resolved that we, the Orange County Board of Commissioners, 
do hereby urge Governor Cooper and Attorney General Stein to hold private contractors such as aero, aero contractors accountable for involvement in the torture program, to enforce state, federal, and international law, and to stop hosting aero at public airports to prevent North Carolina from being the home to torture taxis. This is the 18th day of December, 2018. Need a motion to move? So moved. Um, moved by Green and uh, Commissioner Price. A second. All those in favor? I've got a question oh, before question we move for, to a Yes, vote. sir. Sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Um, yes, uh, for the attorney. Uh, on this now, therefore, it be resolved to hold private contractors such as Aero contractors accountable for involvement in torture program. Exactly what does that mean? And is there any law, state or federal, in, in place now that, that they could be held to, or is this a form of double jeopardy in that they are operating under the law now, but in a change of the law, they could be prosecuted? Well, sir, I, I don't believe I can answer that question. The, the language means what, what it says, but uh, as far as any law that in existence that might apply to that, um, that would take some time for me to look at. Okay. If y'all want to, want to hold off on this, I'll be glad to look for no, that. No, I'm, I'm just curious as to the... And, well, this one you may be able to answer. Can you hold someone in violation if they commit an act or if they were operating this program, can they then be held in to a future law? If someone is committing something now and, and there is no law in existence that prohibits it? Uh, can they be held to a future law? I don't believe so. I, I don't think they can. Uh, that's that's a question for a criminal lawyer or a constitutional scholar. But m my understanding is that they could not. That that would be a retro. That would involve some retroactive enforcement, which would be unconstitutional. I believe. That's what I feel. Uh, and then the second question I've got uh, is maybe a little more nebulous. To stop hosting uh, at public airports to prevent North Carolina to stop hosting Aero. Um, is there a protocol to which a public airport could refuse to allow them to land? I'm uh, assuming there is in that case. Uh, again, I, I'm not familiar with uh, FAA or other aircraft or airport rules, so I, I don't think I can answer that. I, I will be, again, glad to take a look at that. It's, if that's that's not is. necessary. I'm actually going to support this uh, motion. I do have issues, and I think I've raised this before, of uh, bringing resolutions before this board with language in it that is either so vague or so nebulous that it cannot be really understood of what we're voting for. And, and this first one, I don't think that it's constitutional to hold somebody to accountable. How, how can you hold somebody accountable for an act that they've committed currently that there's no law against? And I, I'm, I'm, I like I say, I think that the most reprehensible, the most <coughs> egregious thing that a human can do to another human is to torture them. So, you know, just from that standpoint, I'm going to support it. But I really have issues, and this is not the first time I've said this. This I have issues that we bring resolutions to the board uh, with language in them that is either non-enforceable or so vague and nebulous that it's meaningless. And then we pass these resolutions, they're put on a shelf, and they're forgotten. Commissioner Markopoulos. So I don't read the word accountable as a legal term. Is, is accountable by itself indicate legal action, or is it just <coughs> indicating in, in some way to hold these people to account? I believe that's correct. So, uh, it's not so necessarily a legal what, term. What? What are, you holding, what are you holding them accountable, and how? Well, it doesn't say, but in fact, you can, you can hold somebody accountable. You can do it in any number of ways. It would be a long, a uh, whole other page of, of information on special ways that you might hold someone accountable. But that doesn't strike me as a legal issue. To enforce state, federal, and international law, of course you would do that. And... If it is determined and there's evidence that uh, torture is going on in these places to stop hosting error with public airports, that's a reasonable request. I don't think there's anything that runs afoul of the law. I think it's pretty clear. 
Chair Rich, I, I'm really, I'm really eager to engage in this conversation. But, but, I, but I hope no. I, I really think I would like to present the plaque to to Ms. Mitch and ask we her have to, to vote on that first. First, so we're having oh, a conversation now. So if you if you'd like to add to the to make comment first, that sure. Would be first of all, this is this is about events that are over with. This is about a program uh, that took place shortly after 9/11, uh, up to about what year, 2009 or something like that. The oh, point, yes. the yeah. point is that no. Uh, uh, no, no branch of the state government has taken any interest in investigating what happened here. Uh, no legislative body, no executive branch body, no court has 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 taken up any invitation to investigate the possibility that a contractor, uh, which was a CIA front company that had been running out running for years out of Smithfield, uh, was involved in uh, transporting uh, people to uh, to black sites. Uh, overseas to be to to be tortured in illegal ways, uh, and there's just been no accountability of that, and that's that's what this is about. And it's not about holding anybody to a future law. It's not it's not about um, it's it's not vague in my view. Um, I, I've read the whole report that's online. It's a very well done. Uh, it's it's got a lot of your questions answered, Earl. Um, it's 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 really not about holding someone accountable for laws that haven't been invented yet or that behavior that hasn't happened yet. This is trying to account for things that have happened. In my and in my mind, uh, the person who flew the airplane with full knowledge of what they were doing is just as complicit in an international crime as the person who did the torture. The same way that the Bank, that the person who drives the getaway car is just as guilty of conspiracy to commit a bank robbery as the bank robber is. And this is about uh, um, the, the, the um, um, cover sheet says that this fosters our goal of uh, rejecting oppression and inequity, and that's true, but it also supports uh, the, the board's commitment to transparency and just being open about what really went on here and trying to investigate what happened. Commissioner Dorson. No, I don't need to say anything else. I think Commissioner Green covered it. Commissioner Green covered it. Okay, so we have a first by Commissioner Green, second by uh, Commissioner Price. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Against? Okay, that passes. Now, um, uh, Ms. Mish, would you like to uh, make comment while Ms. Green I, brings that I down I to you? I guess there's some more reports. Of what I was prepared to say was to try to combine the uh, Bill of Rights Day with this resolution because Oh, yeah. You have, to, you have to get your photo okay. up. Okay, I'm supposed to. Oh. <laughs> what am I? Oh, <laughs> you could, you could, you could. <laughs> okay, oh, go ahead. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Right. Okay. Um, what I, w I was trying to relate both the Bill of Rights with um, this resolution because of what I was concerned about, the um, Eighth um, Amendment, which is against torture, uh, the wording for excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fine imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment. So there's a relationship with the Bill of Rights, which are in, um, in our Constitution. Um, not to mention due process. Yes, well, there's other um, amendments, but that's the one that says cruel and unusual punishment. So that's why I wanted to make that point in there. And I also wanted to make the point that um, the um, solitary confinement is concerned a form of torture and is used in U.S. society today. So this, this torture is a practice that must be acknowledged and stopped by all means. It's, it's something that's continuous now, a process that's been done, but the uh, resolution um, that has been uh, that you just passed for the or the North Carolina Commission of Inquiry on um, Torture. That resolution is to take it to the state level, and I. This is what I encourage all people that want to sign. I have this petition.
petition individually, we've taken these to both Governor um, Cooper and to uh, Attorney General Josh Stein to um, take accountability, and this is what we're after, accountability. And what we learned from, and if you read the report, which I, I gave two copies to the, the um, to two of you, and I don't know if this passed around um, to all of you, but I have here a 15-page resume um, of the, uh, full 84 page report with all the documentation for the evidence. It's there in the report, it's online, and people can read it. So it's there, but we want action done. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I said around, maybe I should yeah, stop talking. Thank you. But anyway, I want to thank you for passing the resolution, and I just hope that this reaches the governor and the attorney general because oh. something has to be done. It was found out that the um, people who, the pilots of the planes from Smithfield, were car carrying prisoners strapped naked, blindfolded to the base of the open cargo part of the plane. So if those pilots that live in North Carolina didn't know what they were doing, they it's impossible for them not to know that they were carting people. Just the torturing, carrying them in the planes. Okay. Why don't, why don't we uh, send a forward a copy of our resolution to the governor and the attorney general? Yes, and we could do that, you. yes, thank you. And also, um, there is a copy of the report that Peggy shared with Commissioner Dorson and I in the commissioner's room, or it's somewhere in the office, we can get that for everyone. Yes, Commissioner Well, Green. it's also easily found online at nctortureport.org, which I'd encourage everyone to take a look at. Again, it's a <clears throat> very well done report. And I would also add um, a recommendation to send the copy of the resolution to the Johnston County Commissioners, because as, as is outlined in the report, they, uh, the organization Peggy works with, has been to them repeatedly, and they have either uh, claimed they don't know anything about it, or denied they have any power over it, or even in one case actually defended torture. So, so we are, I, I view us as, as raising our voice because we can and also because others have not. Thank you. Commissioner Green will do that. Commissioner Price? And I would suggest in addition to Johnson County that we can send it to all counties through the county, through the clerk. Sure. And get other counties on board as well. Great. Additional comments? Okay, let's move right on. Commissioner Price? Uh, one thing I forgot about for the elections, uh, Ms. Manager, if we could also find out the cost of the elections for early voting and the total. Okay. Okay, let's move on to D, the pr uh, presentation of the comprehensive annual financial report for the FYI, FYE 630-2018 and the approval of audit contract extensions. And Mr. Dawson, welcome. Uh, Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. So the abstract that you have before you does two things. The first is the acceptance of the FY 2018 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. <coughs> Excuse me. And the second is, as required by the Local Government Commission, the deadline for submitting the audit was December 1st. Uh, the auditors were a couple days behind that on December 4th, and the LGC thus requires uh, a board approval for that extension. Uh, also want to acknowledge staff who's, who's here and have worked on the audit, uh, Paul Lawton and Howard Fitz. If, you can just be stand and be recognized. It is uh, as soon as the budget finishes, it goes six months thereabouts into the, um, the audit. So I just want to recognize them. This is the 27th year that the county has received the excellence in financial reporting. Um, so uh, the plaque is there as well. So we, we'll start with um, presentation by myself and then 
our audit partner, James Benz, is here, and he will uh, then come up. But just really, just a, the fiscal year 2018 in review, it's a lot has been accomplished by the board and, and, and the county, and we just want to highlight some, some of that. When, when the audit partners do their presentation, they focus primarily, and you can argue rightfully so, on the general fund and the um, solid waste and sportsplex fund, as you recall in prior um, presentations. But here, just wanted to give a more holistic view, really more uh, transparent in terms of the, the other funds. And if one slide was to really illustrate the financial position, how did the fund perform during the fiscal year, it would be this particular table. The first um, row there is what you are very familiar with, and we have a slide on the second page, which is the general fund unassigned fund balance, and, and that, is, that is the unassigned fund balance that pertains to the 16% policy, just so you know. And so going from beginning of the fiscal year, which was July 1, 2017, through the end June 30, 2018, you can see as you go straight across the article, sales tax fund um, added about 300000 to, to fund balance to finish at $3.5 million. The Community Development Fund uh, was break-even, and you'll recall in our quarterly reports we had been, we talked about break-even for the general fund, which is we ended slightly better for the general fund um, than break-even. But just going, the Health and Dental Fund, uh, $2.1 million ending fiscal, the ending fiscal year um, reserve was $2.7 million. Uh, housing Section 8 added a little bit. The emergency telephone fund had a slight uh, uh, drawdown, but that was budgeted. The budgeted use was greater, and so they did not. You, that fund did not utilize all of the budgeted drawdown. Uh, and and the fire district f um, funds there. The visitors bureau fund again slightly better than break even. And so you, the one thing. I do want to point out on the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund, you'll look at that, 4.1, and ending $7 million, and think that was due to income statement performance. Uh, we implemented GASB 74, which pertains to the other post-employment benefits, which is the health care-related um, liabilities, and in implementing that, we actually moved that to the government-wide fund from the proprietary fund solid waste. So this is just a balance sheet adjustment and is not due to income statement, profit and lost operations. This fund balance table just shows you, again, just the last three years uh, at that we have complied with the board policy of 16 percent. Uh, we finished the year at 16.23 percent. That 0.23 difference is roughly $487,000. The next board policy, the debt service, as you can see there, uh, the policy is 15 percent, and that just shows you the three years we finished for fiscal year 18. This slide, you know, former Commissioner Jacobs, well, recall in the first meetings, he asked about what is the county's investment strategy, what do we do? So we implemented a few years ago a laddered approach, and what that means is we purchased securities that would mature just in time to meet our uh, disbursement requirements. And so we took advantage of also the increasing interest rate environment by deploying a new um, strategy and investments. So you can see that for the general fund, and likewise the swag board at meetings have, has asked also about investment and investment performance. And 
same strategy and can see the increase there. So these highlights of the on the operating, uh, just from on the operating side. Again, we talked about the um, fund balance and debt service policy. We also, you will recall, we financed existing debt and achieved two million dollars in savings over the life of the obligations. In terms of the general fund, we are moving to reduce the general fund subsidy to the solid waste fund. We had budgeted 1.8 million, and we actually uh, subsidized that fund 1.5 million. And the plan is to, to maintain that, that in ensuing years at 500,000. One of the other things we did when we stated the show the other funds is we decommissioned the vehicle replacement fund because it was just structurally imbalanced and not um, just a blemish. Actually, that was the one fund that had shown an accumulated deficit. So that was subsumed both in the partially in the general fund in the way we operate that and also in the county capital fund. On the capital side, again, you'll recall we had financing of seven and a half million, our spring financing um, that went towards the site acquisition at Northern Campus. We also had acquisition of nine uh, Sheriff Dodge Chargers, three uh, ambulances for emergency services, and uh, solid waste um, equipment, and uh, affordable housing, land banking. And of course, on the GOs, uh, we we closed on the 64 million for Chapel Hill High School, 15.9 uh, million for Orange County Schools. We also did two thirds bonds um, of 5.9 million, and two and a half million for housable, housing bonds for uh, Casa Empowerment and Habitat Humanity. So what, one of the things in terms of what we do during the year to ensure that we are break even or better is you're familiar with the monthly and the quarterly finance reports that we do that look at budget versus actual uh, variances and try to um, not try but do delineate what is due to performance and what is due to timing. And, and illustrate that. And also utilizing economic indicators and our long-term financial model in terms of our estimates. And those reports we send you, the quarterly reports, and we work with continue to collaborate very well with departments. This last slide is something uh, we're going to be emphasizing more looking at key uh, internal control, key performance indicators. And these three are really geared towards improving our year end close process. So the three that, these three that we're tracking by departments are percent of invoices not paid in 30 days. Um, obviously, you know not paying in 30 days, you run late fees and penalties. And, and so that's why we, that's one that we're emphasizing. Also uh, purchasing cars and ensuring that those are reconciled in 30 days as well. And also revenues uh, not timely recorded uh, from a revenue recognition that has implications as well for our um, year end closing. So these are three that we'll be working with departments on and be tracking on a monthly basis, again, to improve as we move into the audit, our closing year and close process. So with that, that uh, concludes, and now concludes my remarks, and James Spence with the auditor will come. While you're coming up, are there any questions for Mr. Donaldson? Okay, welcome. Thank you.
I'm going. Okay, John. <laughs> Help us on the way. Yeah. Same time. <coughs> be locked out at this point. Okay. Help us on the way. <laughs> <laughs> you can just tell us in the old fashioned way. You can start talking to us, yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> while he fixes my fat fingers. Um, good evening. My name is James Bentz. I'm with Malden and Jenkins. I'm one of the partners on the audit engagement. Uh, before you, you have a copy of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, which is the thicker document. Uh, that's your financial statements that your management prepares. And then also along with it, you have our uh, auditor's discussion and analysis, which is our presentation. Uh, that's the document I'm going to go through. I don't intend to read every page. I'm going to go through them. If at any point you have any questions, do feel free to uh, jump in. Obviously, I'll try to answer anything I can. And anything I can't answer tonight, I can get back in touch. Um, so going on page two of the ADNA. Uh, just a little, a little information about our firm. Uh, obviously, most of you all see us once a year when we come to do the presentation. Uh, we're a regional firm. Uh, we, your audit is based out of our Atlanta office. Uh, we serve 400 governments throughout the Southeast, and um, government auditing is something that we specialize in, and it's something I do year-round. Uh, we have about 90 people throughout our firm that do government audits, uh, and it's about 28% of what our firm does as a whole is work with local governments. Um, as it says at the bottom of the page, I was the audit service partner. We also have uh, an engagement partner who's Joel Black, who's responsible for signing the documents. And all of our audits have a quality control review who's independent of the audit altogether and has nothing to do with the county, but kind of makes sure we've done everything under the standards we're required to do before we issue anything. Um, on page three, uh, just to kind of emphasize the comprehensive annual financial report that you have is your document. It's your financial statements that your management's prepared. As the independent auditors, it's our responsibility to come in and audit that document. We don't test 100% of everything, but we, we test enough to issue our opinion as to whether or not the financial statements are materially correct as presented. Um, we performed our audit in accordance with general auditing standards accepted in the United States, as well as government auditing standards. and. Thank you. And we were able to issue a clean opinion, which is stating that the financial statements are materially correct as presented. All right. So as part of that audit, your financial statements also include the financial information related to the ABC board. Uh, we are not their auditors, and so our opinion as their numbers are relate, as, our, as our opinion related to their numbers is completely based on their independent auditor's report. Um, we obtained their financial statements and reviewed their audit report, um, and their numbers are incorporated in yours. But again, we don't audit them. Uh, we do, through our audit process, review the significant <coughs> estimates and accounting judgments that are in your financial statements and made by management. And we didn't note anything that's unusual for uh, government <coughs> county within North Carolina. Through the audit process, uh, we did have a few audit adjustments. Those have been provided to management, discussed with management, and as well included in the financial statements that you have before you. <coughs> On page six, really the important thing to kind of emphasize here is again uh, our independence uh, based on the professional AICPA standards. We are, you are required to have an independent audit. Uh, all of the financial information included in your financial statements are decisions and determinations based by management. And as the independent auditors, we audit those outcomes. Uh, I, I'll kind of skim through these, but uh, some financial data, kind of similar to what Mr. Donaldson just presented. Uh, we've got your general fund, which 
most outside parties, when they look at a, a local government's financial statements, the general fund is typically where they tend to go to look at the activity. And so that's where we do focus on when we do our presentations. Uh, your general fund, fund balance for the last five years, you can see your unassigned number, which is essentially your amount available going forward for future use, has maintained a pretty steady percentage given the use of the total fund balance. And so you're, you're currently at 16.2%, uh, which is about 3.6 months worth of expenditures in your fund balance. Uh, GFOA, who is, who is the Government Finance Officers Association, uh, that's the entity that you all submit the CAFR to. Um, they typically like to see people at about two months. And so if you're trying to benchmark for a June year in where your financial general fund looks, uh, generally we say look at your unassigned and see where that number is. Um, in North Carolina, you also have a restriction, the state stabilization amount, which is a portion of your fund balance that you can't use that is kind of maintained by state law to keep your general funds healthy. And so really, if you're trying to compare yourself to GFOA, you'd really add that on top because nationally that's not a number that most entities would use. So when you look at that big picture, it kind of makes you look a little better than the 16%. Uh, for the last five years, pr your taxes are typically, for most governments and for you all, one of your main revenue sources. And this just shows you on a per capita level what those revenues have been. Um, your general fund budget to actual, we've, we've condensed to a very, very high level view. And so if you look at your revenues, we got your revenues, expenditures, and then your net transfers. And you can see for the year, you've got your original amounts and your, amended, your amendments, and then your final approved budget, which is what you all operated for the fiscal year on. And you can see your revenues came in about 2.5% better than anticipated. At the same time, your expenditures were about 3% better than anticipated. And so I believe, based on the quarterly reports that you all get, you've been anticipating better results than the budget said. And so obviously you approved a final budget to use 11 million of your general fund reserves. Um, and over the course of the fiscal year through the outcomes, you actually added about 600,000 to the bottom line. Um, uh, your enterprise funds, a uh, little bit different. They're in a full accrual environment. And so a lot of times people, they don't have a fund balance, they have a net position. Um, a lot of folks will look at the cash flows to kind of get an idea where those stand. Uh, not a surprise, it's, it's something you all budget, but kind of the, the, the important takeaway from those is that all of three of them are still relying on your transfers in from other funds to subsidize their operations. Um, solid Waste had about 1.4 million transfers in, uh, which is lower than what you budgeted, but still is something that that fund relies on. Uh, starting on page 11, just to kind of point out, this year was a different year for North Carolina governments and specifically for counties. Um, the way that your state and federal awards, fund grant awards are reported has changed pretty dramatically. Uh, historically, any direct benefits where the state actually makes payments to, to people in your county um, have been reported on your CFA, which is the schedule of federal and state awards even though that doesn't flow through you as a county. And so the easy, the big example is the Medicaid. Um, you all determine eligibility, but the actual disbursement of those Medicaid benefits doesn't come from Orange County, it comes from the state. And the state's historically required you to report that on your schedule. It, this year was the first year that they've made the decision they're not going to require that for counties. And so in the past, your CFA has reported about $93 million of federal and state support in Orange County. This year, now that they've taken those dollars off, it drops it down to about 22 million. Um, the big change that it has on the audit is those big benefits that are no longer on there were skewing what gets tested by the uh, federal guidance and state guidance. And so it's your thresholds for determining what's a type A program, which is what we typically end up looking at, drop from 2.8 million to about 750,000. Uh, which changed the, the volume of testing. And so in the past, you guys have averaged about two federal programs a year. This year, we're testing eight federal programs and one state program. So obviously, that drop in the threshold from those benefits rolling off had a big impact on counties, not just Orange County, but every county in the state had the same thing happen. And it changed the compliance audits drastically across the state. 
Um, can I ask you a question about that? Yes, sir. Can I ask a question about that? So th is that just a change in the way things get reported, or is there some substantive significance as far as the county's f overall fiscal health that we should be concerned about? In short, no, there was no change. The biggest effect of that is there's that, this next little subsection here. There's a new audit, so to say, that you all have to have. And so the state still requires auditors to come in and audit the eligibility determination, but now because it's not part of your financial packet, they require agreed upon procedures, which was a separate engagement that we did with you all, where we have to come in and do similar testing, but now the state, the, the office of the state auditor specifically said, these are the steps we want you to do, go out and do them and issue a report. And so we had to do that separate of your financial audit. Um, and that was submitted back to the state in October, um, citing no, based on the procedures we performed, citing no instances of um, eligibility, misdetermination and eligibility. Right, so they just change the way you do this stuff, but Absolutely. the underlying substantive outcomes of however you now have to do it is that everything is copacetic. Correct. Okay. In a very loose term. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, yes. we're not accountants, so I mean, that's, that's what, the fact that the things get changed has less significance to me than to knowing that as a result of now having to do things differently, Every, the audit still is clean. It, it's still clean. Uh, the bigger takeaway would just be to know that more of your programs are going to be subject to compliance review now than they've been in the past. Right. Um, Thank which you. is maybe some more comfort for you. Um, on page 12. Next. Hold on one second. Yes, I'm sorry. Stop Quick question on that. Does that add expense to the county to do those additional audits? It does. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. On page 12, um, it's a, this is a, an, I guess I call it an occasional pr pr uh, attestation service that we provided. Um, as a participant in the state uh, local government employees retirement system, they are required to have an audit every year on their program uh, in order to comply with GASB 67 <coughs> and 68. What they do instead of testing every government is they'll, they'll haphazardly select a sample of governments each year and they cycle through. In theory, you shouldn't be picked every year. And this year, Orange County was selected for testing for the calendar year 2017 census data that's provided to the actuaries for the valuation of the pension plan. Um, and when that happens, the county has to contract with their auditors to go out and have the census data tested and we were able to complete that testing back in October as well. And that was issued to the state, citing that all the census data information that we sampled was submitted properly to the state. And they used that statewide to kind of aggregate and determine if their uh, employee data is accurate for purposes of valuing the pension liability, which ultimately at the state level is allocated to all the participants. So you all do report a component of that. Um, and then also separately from that, uh, management and has contracted with us to perform some agreed upon procedures. We did a few departments last year related to cash handling and the processes around those. Um, this year we've, we're working to, I think I lost that, there we go. We're working to kind of test all of the other departments that have significant cash intake. Um, we're in the process of that and we anticipate having that report for you all in the early spring of upcoming spring. Uh, page 13 and 14, um, through the audit process, as I mentioned earlier, we had a few audit adjustments. Uh, with the audit, with government auditing standards, it sort of dictates some of those anytime met when we have to make audit adjustments, um, those being reported as deficiencies in the internal control structure. Uh, the, the adjustments we had were all predominantly classification issues, and they were items, whether it be you know, the first item on here related to the debt financing was classification in issues in that the items were recorded by management, but the classification within the various funds were in the wrong places, and so we had to make adjustments to true those up. Um, the expenditure expense recognition item we had was audit adjustments related to the period in which they're recognized. Um, obviously, these t tend to stem around the cutoff of the fiscal year, and so they were currently being reported in fiscal year 19, but as the services were received in fiscal year 18, we moved them from 19 to 18. So 
while they're big dollar adjustments, they are things that management had on your books and they weren't unrecorded items that we found that needed to be booked. And so it, standards requires to report these, they're included in your reports, but I do want to kind of emphasize that these aren't unrecorded items, they're just mis, more or less misclassifications or period recognition items. Um, on page 15, uh, this is just something as our firm, we've kind of focused on a little bit. It's kind of been a, been a bit of a big news ticket item in the recent years, but cybersecurity is obviously something that everyone needs to be aware of and, and on the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, we we kind of went through some internal controls with the IT processes here, and one of the things that we just recommend that you all work towards and that from our understanding that, that is being worked towards is just kind of implementing an overall cybersecurity risk management program that effectively deals with the monitoring and testing of the controls in place and not just stopping at documenting what the controls should be, but also kind of monitoring and testing them to make sure that they are effective um, over the, the ever-changing timeline of cybersecurity needs. Um, page 17, uh, we can go into any of these you want, but for the next several pages, what we've got are the very high-level overview of the new upcoming accounting standards. Um, pardon uh, me, um, Chair. Yes, ma'am. Just a, follow a question about the cybersecurity risk management. Is that a terribly costly thing to implement? I don't know that I can answer that question. Um, it's It starts with a study, and then depending on how detailed or how often you set up your monitoring, it can all be in-house. It may require additional personnel, um, but it's, it, the, the, from our standpoint right now, the, the emphasis is getting the policy in place and then the carrying out of that, I guess giving you an answer on the cost of that would be a little tough at the moment. So we would need to commit to having a policy and then investigate how to do it. Sounds yes, like. Yeah, thank you. Um, 17 through 20, those are new upcoming accounting standards. Uh, we do proactively try to work with management to make sure that they're aware of these and when they're coming so that there's not the surprise of, hey, we're here for an audit. This was supposed to be implemented, make sure it was. Um, but obviously, we want to present them to you because things that may or may not be relevant now based on decisions you all make could change. Um, and so these are here. The, the biggest one that really <coughs> is upcoming is still a ways off, but in 2021, uh, the way that governments account for leases will have a change. Um, it's going to be a big change for most most governments across the board. Um, it's not something that anyone requires or encourages for early implementation, so we're still a couple years off, but that's really the biggest one that's going to have a significant effect on the county. Um, with that, if you all have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but that's all I have. Okay, additional questions? James said you had a few questions during the, I'm sorry, Commissioner Bedford, you had a few questions, were they all answered for you during the week? Oh, yes, I had misread uh, okay. what the extension meant, and, and uh, that was explained, that it was just the dates and not an extension of the actual auditing contract. Great. Thank you. Everybody so, else good? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So in the big audit report, page 20 is where uh, we should be focusing our attention. Yes. I mean, those numbers match up. I'm sorry? On page page 20, then, I'm a new commissioner, mm -hmm. so um, I have not uh, reviewed prior audit reports. So I'm, you know, just got this right now, and I'm glancing through it, and is page 20, the uh, general fund statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balances would be the key focus. That's your budget schedule? Mm-hmm, with um, the actual? Yes, and so if you wanted to look at the budget for your general fund, that's a, a key schedule. Mm -hmm. I would say 17, really 17 through 20 would be good schedules to look at. Mm -hmm. um, that, that gives you your major funds of your governmental activities and kind of the performance, the balance sheet and the income statement, if you will, are 17 and 18. Thank you. And then page 20 is specifically the budget performance of the general fund. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And, and I, uh, I don't know what our practice is, but I think it would be very helpful to have had these in advance of tonight's meeting for next year. So we could actually look at them and, and know what the financial results were um, before having the presentation. Okay, we can make a note of that. Any other questions? 
Thank you. Thank you all. And Gary, do you want to come on up and take this plaque? Whoa, because it weighs a ton. <laughs> yeah. I will read it. It says Orange County Finance Office Association Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Finance Reporting presented to Orange County, North Carolina. Thank you, Gary. Wow, that's really heavy. I'll throw that. Mm -hmm. And Chair Rich, do we need to have a motion yep. to we will do to that. approve the extension? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. So the recommendation is the manager recommends that the board receive the comprehensive annual financial report as information and that the board approve the audit contract extension per North Carolina general statute. And I need a motion for that, please. I move. Okay. We got McKee and Price. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Okay, that passes. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your being here. Okay, we have no public <coughs> hearings, and that moves us into six, the regular agenda. And this is the um, guidelines um, to approve the proposal program guidelines for the new Orange County Local Rent Supplement Program, OCLRSP, and to authorize the county manager to execute the necessary agreement with the Orange County Housing Authority to administer the new Orange County Local Rent Supplement Program. And this is Ms. Hampton. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Commissioners. You should have received information in your packets, you all, at the November 8th workshop um, um, work session. Ask for some specific changes. I call your attention to page three of the table, starting with page two. I'm sorry, start with page two of the table under eligible subsidy costs. There was a question about the um, bedroom sizes and what would happen if we had a family going to or needed a larger bedroom. So as first thing, we have a limited budget um, and we're trying to stay within the allocated funds um, that you gave us. We took a look at those unit sizes that are most prevalent, um, what we see requests for. We know we, we could not serve um, families with sizes above this. So that's why you see the, and it should be highlighted in yellow in your table to show how we answered your question there and how we would address that. We do not want to, um, the need is so great in the county. We did not want to, um, we want to manage expectations. And so if you're not meeting one of these budget, one of these bedroom sizes by your household size, then you're not even, um, you will, your application will not be considered at this time. On page three, under funding policies, um, there are some changes there. And even past, in addition to the yellow, there was a correction that was needed. And thank you, Commissioner Green. That was in, that correction has been made and is under question two in the response to Commissioner Green's questions. So we noted that that is the correct um, th um, change here, the board, since this is a county program, approves all policies. You are, if you approve tonight, the housing authority will administer um, the local rent supplement program and can only, only make very minor changes as it relates to implementation. And any major change or major deviation from these guidelines would have to come back to the board. Um, so the others, um, there was a concern that the guidelines needed to very clearly talk about um, displacement due to the closure of manufactured home parks as well as other urgent community needs. So that is addressed in item six where we um, specifically address the mobile home park closures and urgent community need. We did not, there was a question regarding rather why we were not 
targeting veterans. Um, as such, we have one voucher program for veterans that's solely for them. And if a veteran is homeless, they have a preference here. We did not want to pile on too many preferences because we wanted to make sure that we could use the number of vouchers that we have um, to make a dent in our need. So when you have one group receiving too many preferences, excuse, excuse the use of the voucher. So we want it since they are covered, there is a homeless preference. And um, there is another program for veterans uh, within the county. And we'll be applying again. And we are currently working with the Durham uh, VA on this. We did not give veterans a preference at this time based on the allocation we have. On page four, <laughs> outreach and marketing. Um, there was a request that the board made to have us contact um, social service agencies and other providers that are within that 10 mile radius where our voucher could go. And we will do that and that's why we included it here. And that's on page four under the section on outreach and marketing. And I think lastly on page seven, Again, you will see, um, and that will be in at the very top of the page, um, you will see that persons displaced due to an urgent community need <coughs> and how they will be addressed, i.e., um, the manufactured home park closures, and those persons would be referred. There'll be a form um, that our office would give them so we will know they are coming to us under this category and we will work with um, Empowerment, which is the, has the contract for relocation coordination services. They will make that referral to us and then we will work with those individuals um, in that category. So these are the changes. I think there is one other, but it still addresses urgent community need on page eight at the top of the page. And so that just gives further um, explanation or inclusion for um, urgent community need. I am also going to mention in the response um, that was given to Commissioner Green's question as well as her additional question, the local rent supplement program will mirror, uh, mirror several of the policies that are current policies under the county's uh, or the housing authority's voucher program. We did that to ensure some continuity and to mitigate confusion among constituents as well as the potential for any legal ramifications. Why am I getting it? You're offering it. It's a county program even though it's federally funded. And so um, we are mirroring what's in the current policy as it relates to criminal background checks. And we looked at, as uh, Commissioner Green so graciously shared, the admissions policy from the housing authority uh, in Chapel Hill, which is public housing, which differs. And so we took a look at that. And because we are reviewing on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, we don't have a rigid set determination. <coughs> Our policy, which was approved by HUD, does meet with their requirement and the most recent notice of granting some leeway around criminal background checks. And so that's what you have in the responses that were given. So I'll stop now if there are any questions, Madam Chair. Question. Commissioner Green. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Hampton. Um, um, I'm learning a lot here. And um, I do have a, a follow-up thought about the, about my concern is strictly the, the how, how to deal with ex-offenders when, when they make applications. And um, I think it would be worthwhile to have a joint conversation between 
you and the, the town housing authority folks to see if there's a way to actually get uh, perhaps the town's policy, as, as you've pointed out by showing, showing us your uh, um, um, housing choice, the, the HUD policy, uh, perhaps the town policy needs to be changed to be, to be made more, more flexible. Um, can you just, re when you reference town, could you? The town of Chapel Hill. Yeah. Um, so as Ms. Hampton pointed out, Orange County is not traditional in the way we do public housing. A lot of, most counties have a, a single authority like we have a WATSA as a separate authority, that's a regulatory authority. In this county, the functions are split up between Orange County that does the vouchers and the town of Chapel Hill that, <clears throat> that does the units. And for that reason, uh, and which is really consistently, as you were talking about, about between the, the uh, housing choice vouchers and the local program, I think it would be worthwhile to sit down and have a thoughtful review of these two policies and see if there's some way that they can be um, harmonized better. For example, I, I, I am aware that uh, in Chapel Hill, if if you have an arrest that is dismissed on, on the merits, like there's no evidence for, for the arrest, then that arrest has no weight whatsoever in your application. Uh, whereas it looks like in this material you sent, uh, an, an arrest is not considered as, uh, as heavily against you as a conviction would be, but there is some consideration given, it, given to it. And I, I don't have all, I haven't synthesized all the details of both of the, uh, of the sets of eligibility requirements, but it just seems to me it would be worthwhile to have that kind of joint review. And I would petition um, the board to ask the manager to, con to come up with some suggestions for how to structure that. Perhaps it's town staff, town of Chapel Hill staff and county staff plus one or two commissioners plus the mayor and maybe another council member. Because this, I think the elected officials need to be involved. This is really a policy matter. Thoughts? What, what, how do other folks feel about that? Well, we could take that as a petition. And okay, bring that, that's my um, petition. Bring that to staff, and then we, we can come back uh, with a recommendation. Right. I've had at that meeting. I, I, I do think that we've not we've found that we're not consistent in a lot of things that we do mm -hmm. with housing, and we we have asked, um, and we have tried mm -hmm. to um, uh, come together. Um, ar around the mobile parks, we found we were on different pages with that. So, so we have been trying and making those efforts. So, um, Ms. Manager, do you want to add to that? Um, I would um, just inform the board that we meet with the town of Chapel Hill, the housing, um, and the town of Chapel Hill, the town of Carborough, the town of Hillsboro, on a monthly basis. We have the meeting with the managers and the staff to meet and talk about together about what we're doing. They are aware of this local program. There was an interest um, for them to um, participate in this local program, but then there was a um, <coughs> transition between the um, the management at the manager level, and so it's something that we are going forward with, but we're continuing the conversation as the town of Chapel Hill also looking into doing this program with us at some point. So um, we are talking with them, they're aware of this, we continue to talk with them on housing issues, and we have been for some time, and we will continue to do that and have them review this, have them review this with us. Well, I appreciate that, but I still think that, that this is a very particular conversation, and maybe it only includes Chapel Hill in the county because we're the two participants in the Housing Authority, but I, I do think it would be useful and helpful to have a, 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 a thorough, thoughtful review, particularly of this one policy that I'm talking about, uh, and have some elected official input, because I do view it as a, as a really high-level policy matter and not just a matter of implementation. Okay, so we can review that. Any additional questions from Ms. Hampton? I have a comment. Commissioner Dorson. Um, this is exciting. It's great to see this happening. I echo Commissioner Green's sentiments about trying to make it as accessible as possible, whatever we can do to minimize the secondary impacts related to criminal justice issues. This is just a, this is not a substantive issue, but I think that we ought to come up with a better name for this or acronym. OCLRSP is, you know, 
a mouthful and we want to market the thing, so we should come up with a creative an acronym. Mm -hmm. I mean, acronym like OCRA, <laughs> Orange County Rental Assistance, something that is catchy <laughs> and, uh, well, something else then, you know, but uh, something that is, you know, it's just, it just gets lost in the, in the description of what we're doing. So just something, um, you know, uh, what, what's awkward now? Um, uh, it's, it's rural, rural assistance. Rural, rural, rural assistance. Orange yeah. County rural assistance. So anyway, we ought to come up with a better name than OCLRSP. It's we just. We will certainly try. Come up. Yeah, Commissioner Doris. No, we need something that's a word, you know, like uh, something that's, you know, that either, either is a word or is something catchy, like, you know. Orca. No, maybe not. <laughs> you know. We will certainly try. Local, something that has, you know, local and rent, something like that. There ought to be something mm -hmm. where we have a communications department. I mean, part of the, it, you know, I'm not being glib. I mean, part of the challenge of this is going to be marketing it. Not, uh, you know, obviously we know the people who need it want it, but we've got to sell this thing to landlords and, you know, uh, we want to get buy-in from the towns, and so um, it's just something else that we, you know, and this is a this is a great innovative step that is, you know, is consistent with our vision uh, and our the county's leadership on these issues, and so we, we ought to figure out a way to make that, you know, to highlight that. Thank you. We will. I just want to briefly yeah. add my appreciation for all the effort that's gone to this. Obviously, it happened before uh, uh, Commissioner Bedford and I came along, but it, it, it is obvious all the thought and hard work that's gone into it, and it really is a great program, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so um, our recommendation is the manager recommends the board to adopt and authorize the chair to sign a resolution approving the proposed guidelines for the OCLRSP. <laughs> <laughs> and authorizing the county manager to execute the necessary agreement with the Orange County Housing Authority after consultation with the county attorney. I need motion. So moved. Second. Dorson and Price. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and that passes. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you we'll, so much. We'll think of a new name. You know, who used to be very good at that is Commissioner Jacobs, so you can give him a call if you want and, you know, get <laughs> him involved. I will do that. that. Yeah. <laughs> I will do that, and I will work with uh, Mr. McGee, Todd McGee. Great. Thank you Thank so you. much. The best I came up with was, oh, crap, but that didn't seem no. like such a good one. Right. Orange County Rental Assistance Program. Well, it, people will remember it, but. Or crap. Yeah. No, no, no. All right. Now we move to that exciting portion of our meeting where um, we are going to pick uh, board assignments. And um, I've asked Commissioner Dorsey to sit next to me tonight because it's the first time I am going to be running through this process, and he's going to... Um, help if he can. I just wanted to mention a few things. Um, last year we decided that we were going to change um, uh, the procedure and how we did this and um, one of the things we wanted to make sure is that everybody had an opportunity to uh, to have to be on the boards and we found that some commissioners were holding on to their boards for a very long time and other commissioners weren't able to get onto those boards to learn how those boards ran, ran. so um, in in those discussions um, we decided that uh, the intra intragovernmental boards um, would be um, two years you would be able to be on that board for two years but it would be one year one year at a time so it's two one-year terms um, the regional boards would be four one-year terms. It doesn't quite say that, that they say that in um, our attachment. Um, and as we were discussing this, we also found a couple of other snags that I think that we really do need to go back and and review, um, but not for tonight. Tonight we're just going to um, go ahead and, and choose our boards, but maybe a couple of months down the road we could take a look at that and, and make sure that this is still working. Um, I'd like to also mention that um, while we were talking about the boards, there, there was reasoning for picking the two years and the four years. And four years for some of these boards, and um, Commissioner Markopoulos, I'm going to use you as an example, but I'm not picking on you or anything. But for example, like a Go, a go Triangle board is an intra, uh, is, an, is a, a regional board. 
there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to do, and there's a lot to continue to do. So it would, it would make sense for you to be on that board for more than one year. If you don't want to be on that for the entire four years, that would be up to you. But it would, it would make sense that that would happen. And I hope that um, the commissioners had a chance to talk to each other to understand what those boards were and, and why those were important to um, either stay on that or continue for another year. Um, uh, and then if you didn't want to be on the, that board, that would be up to you. Um, does, does that, I, I wasn't picking on you. I didn't want you to think I was. Is that okay? I can handle it. You can handle it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the way that this works is that um, round one, we have the, the senior members of the commission will um, pick a board that they would like to remain on. And we're going to start with um, Earl, I'm sorry, Commissioner McKee, I'm, I, I can't get your name straight tonight. I don't Determined. know why. You're just like I'll all the way over there. I don't know I'll, why I can't. I'll answer to anything. Anything? Okay, well, that's good. And if you could just call out what page your board is on, so that could be marked off. And so there's one, two, three, four, five pages. If you can call out what page it's on, so we can all <coughs> kind of take a look and uh, cross that off as we go. So, hey, Commissioner. Yes. So, I'm sorry. Is it all right? You can, you can always say Chair Rich and you okay. know, I will recognize right. you. Before we get started, would you mind, uh, some of you veterans, just sort of give me an uh, overview of what the expectations are and responsibilities That's being a, a liaison question. to, to these various question. committees? Yeah, and we, we did talk about that at, at our um, one of our board meetings. Uh, I work sessions, rather. So, so you know, we are the liaisons to these boards, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what, our first responsibility is to be at, at the meeting. If you can't make the meeting, what we decided at our last uh, work session was that you would let the clerk know. Mm -hmm. uh, you would send an email to the clerk, and she would then send that out to everybody if you didn't get a chance to send that out to everybody. It's really important that that someone be there to represent Orange County at, at, at these meetings. Um, the intra-governmental uh, ones are important. The regional ones are especially important because we do want a voice at the table when we're talking about regional issues. Um, in return, when you're done with the, your meetings, it, we either talk about them at our three-minute period. We, we give a report out. Um, sometimes it's a short report out. Sometimes it's long. Um, when it's a long report out, what I've been doing is um, taking notes at the meeting and then sending them to all the board members right after the meeting. Um, whichever works for you, it's just as, as, you, as you can be inclusive as possible to get, keep all the board members informed of what's going on. Thank you. Does that help? Yes. And John, can you just um, review with us um, why it's important that not more than three board members go to any committee meeting at a time? Um, because if four members go, that is, to, by law, that is an official meeting of this board because it, it constitutes a, a quorum of this board. And so uh, it would violate open meeting and notice laws. And um, well, that's, that's the only reason, open yeah. meeting and notice laws. So you can go to a, a meeting that you're uh, you're not the liaison to, but it would be advisable to either let the clerk know or the the members of the the person that is the actual liaison mm -hmm. let them know before you go. So we don't want, we don't come into that circumstance where there would be more than three people um, at the table. Okay, so Commissioner McKee, we're gonna let you keep your board first, and which one would that be? Uh, page four, top of the page, Chapel Hill Chamber of Commerce. Page four, <laughs> top of the page. Where am I seeing that? Hard copy. Okay, maybe I don't have the same hard copy. In the agenda packet, attachment. Oh, I see page it. Okay. Four. Okay. Okay, and Commissioner Dorson. Um. Uh, I think I'll stick with the Justice Advisory Council. So what page is that, please? Well, it says six on the electronic. It's the top. It's the first one. I see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Commissioner Price. <coughs> uh, the MPO, Durham, Durham Chapel Hill. And page, Carver, please. Uh, MPO. What page is that, please? I'm trying to find it. Um, two. No, four. I'm sorry, page four. Okay. And then I'm going to keep the Visitors Bureau, and that is on the very uh, last page. And Commissioner Mark Cobbles. Go Triangle. 
And that is on page, page five. five. Okay. Okay, so those are all the keep boards. And now we're going to move into round two, um, and it's the it goes from the um, for the new members, and then it goes back down to the senior members, and we go in alphabetical order. So, Commissioner Bedford, you're up first. The community oversight board, with a, a page one okay. or page three, excuse me, with OPC Community Operations Center. That was community oversight board. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just a correction: that is now the Central Community committee and it's not really an oversight anymore and it's combined with elements and uh, Chatham I mean uh, Caswell okay Commissioner Green um, the Justice Advisory Council and that was on here okay. Where are you? Six, page, six, top. page six top and Commissioner Mark Coplis uh, Durham Tech it should be page four. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Dorson. Uh, I don't, I thought we we're going back up the list. So we're going down the other way now. Yeah, but we're Jamie. going, we're going backwards in the way we went, right? So I went Earl. in the first, I went after Earl. You went early. We're going the other way now, though. We're doing the other, we're going the other way. Yeah. That's that's in the next round. That's round three. We're going round two now. Yeah. I the first round it went Earl, me, Renee, you, Mark. Right. And aren't we going back up in that same reverse order? We go. We're going the, the opposite direction now, right? So we're going for the, the youngest members to the senior members. Yeah, but in alphabetical orders, I think is what he's getting at. So you you're. You're in alphabetical order. Oh, okay. Next. Yeah. Even though you're the youngest member. He's the youngest member. Yeah. Oh, in dog years. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, I'm gonna pick. Um, I'm gonna pick the uh, Orange County Local Government Affordable Housing Collaborative. That's on page five. Page five. Okay. Orange. Mark D. You're done. Okay, Commissioner Price. Um, hang on. Oh, the, um, hang on one second. The, orange, uh, the Chatham Orange Joint Planning Task Force. Where is that at? Page three. Three? Mm -hmm. Where is that? It's at the bottom, <laughs> bottom. of page three. Okay. I don't see that. It's the very last one. <clears throat> Under Burlington Graham. You don't see that? <clears throat> That's page one. No, that's not page three. No, oh, this up here. Okay. Uh, okay. Numbers, yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. And I am going to pick um, swag. Where is swag? Solid waste. Okay. It's on page seven top. And Commissioner McKee? Board of Health. Page three top. Second one down, right under ABC board. Okay. Okay, and Earl, you get another one. I'm sorry, Commissioner McKee, you get another oh, one. Oh. Uh, you threw me for a loop there. You gave me two at one pop. Yeah, I, knew, you're, you're, I, knew that, I knew how that worked. You knew that was coming. I yeah. knew, yeah, Community Home Trust. Oh, wait, hang on one second. We um, just went... You're right. I mean, it, it goes up, then I get, I choose last, mm -hmm. and yep. then I choose you're, first. You choose first, yes. Yeah, you, yep. you're so, right. And yep. I knew that, but yep. just when you reminded me of it, it just threw me. Okay, and like so. It's just like fantasy baseball. It is, yeah. <laughs> yep. My fantasy football team was horrible this year. But okay, it's on what do you, what page you, four. Yep. Third one down, Community Home Trust. Community Home Trust? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, and then Commissioner Dorson. Um, I'll take the Fire Chiefs Association. That's on page four at the bottom. Thank you, sir. I've been on that a long time. I figured it was time to get No, I was else. afraid you were going to pick it right now. <clears throat> no, no, that was, uh, I was going to let somebody else have it. I've been, at, I've had it for about seven years. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Price. Family Success Alliance. And that is here. Okay. And I am going to go with um, the Triangle J Cog, and I want to be the alternate on that. And let's see, that is. Oh, do I see that? Seven. Page, Page seven. seven. Okay. And I'm going to be the alternate. Okay. And then Commissioner Markopoulos. I'll take the swag. Swag. Top of page seven. Got it. So that's done. Okay, Commissioner <coughs> Green. Uh, TJ Cog. Cog. Okay, so you're going to be the uh, the representative. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, and Commissioner Bedford. Uh, Board of Social Services on page three. Three Board of Social Services. Okay. <clears throat> and then that one is done. Okay, and um, Commissioner Bedford, you go again. Oh, it's I know. sorry, I know it yep. came around quickly. Yep, I just can't remember the name of it. It's the one with the loans, um, the small business loan program on page six. The bottom. Small business. Okay, so that one is complete. Okay, Commissioner Green. Um, TARPO, Triangle Area of Rural Planning. And it's green. And you're going to be the, the representative? The, the main representative. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Markopoulos. <coughs> uh, Family Success Alliance. Family Success which, Alliance. Which one? That's page four. Page four. Or there were two members on that one, I believe, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Family Success Alliance is now done. Commissioner Dorson. Uh, let's see. I'll take the uh, North-South Bus Rapid Transit Policy Committee. That's on page six. Commissioner Price? Oh, let me see. Um, I guess the um, the Go Triangle uh, Special Tax Board. Mm -hmm. That's on page five, third one down. Okay. Special Tax Board. Special Tax Board. <coughs> yep. Um, I'm going to choose the um, uh, MPO alternate. <coughs> Which page? That is on page four. One, two, three, fourth one down. Okay. Is that, is that done now? The uh, MPO the, is done now, yeah. The Durham one, not the Berlin. Okay. Durham, yep. Commissioner McKee, you're up. And you got two, so think think quick. So think quick is not in my parameters. <laughs> uh, first pick would be the Intergovernmental Parks Work Group. Um, That's on page five. One, page two, three, five. five. One, two, three, five. Member or the alternate? Uh, member. You're the member on that one, okay. Uh, where is it? Page, Page five. five, yep. Third one up from the bottom, okay. And, and then you go again. Oh. Commissioner McKee. Um, I'm gonna be honest, I'm looking for meetings that 
In the evenings, the, yeah. In the evenings, yes. It won't take but just a moment. Uh, page five, the public uh, safety training facility work group. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Dorson. Can, can you give a quick rundown of what's left? Yeah, so let's go. Um, we just have going the ABC down from board. the top. Yeah. yeah. Okay. ABC board, we have one left. And um, Donna, please help me if I make a mistake, okay? Um, and then um, on that page, we have the Burlington Graham MPO. We have two positions there left. Um, the Orange, uh, Chatham Orange Joint Planning Task Force, we have one position left. Uh, page four, um, the Chapel Hill Carborough School Work Group. Um, and that was uh, well I had talked to a uh, Commissioner Dorson I had asked that question about a couple months ago was this group still meeting and you had responded back that it was even though it had not met recently I don't think have you had any contact yeah I don't think that group is meeting do you not I know no I, know I don't I think that was about the bond that was about right. trying to finalize the, the and I could not get any inform any information from the Chapel Hill Carver City Schools by I the think time this was done. published yeah. so, so we'll take that one off. I, I don't think that group is meeting anymore Travis is, am I wrong wasn't that focused on drawing down that bond okay so we're done yeah. with that one so then on that same page four, uh, we have the Durham Orange Chapel Hill work group. We have two positions left there. On, um, and that's on page four. On page five, we have the Food Council. That's one position. Go Triangle Community Advisory Committee is one position. And then we have the Healthy Carolinas is one position. Uh, Jordan Wait, is Lake, there, is, I'm sorry. Did we fill up the tax board? That has two on it. I'm sorry, you're did correct. Did we fill that up We already? did not. We did not. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then um, Intergovernmental Parks Works Group, we need an, an alternate. And the Jordan Lake uh, One Water Association, there's one. We also need another person on the Ch Joint Public Safety Training Facility Work Group. Joint, correct. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll take that one. Okay. The public safety one. And I did talk to Diana Jeffries today, even though she is on vacation, but she did answer. They are still, they haven't met recently, but they are still together as a group, as a status. Okay. Yeah, they didn't meet at all last okay. year because I was on it. And, and, and if I might make a comment uh, for the other commissioners, uh, I have found it extremely difficult to make the Upper News River Basin Association meetings. I've done some of them by phone, which is less than satisfactory, I think, for me and for the group. Okay. Uh, it, takes, <coughs> it, it meets basically in the middle of the day. Is that something that we could send staff to if we can't make uh, the it? Staff has been going, yes. Okay, so that might be something. But I mean, if somebody is interested, and I was fairly aggressive about it when I first got on there, but I had time to, to do those meetings then. But Okay. Uh, well, maybe it, one of our new commissioners. Maybe, is. yep. Okay, so page six, we have um, the JCPC. There is one position there. Um, the legislative work group, um, there's two positions there. Are we doing that one this year? Are we going to do that this year? Yeah. Um, the NCACC and the NACO are done with. Uh, North South BRT is done. Orange County Partnership for Young Children, there's one position there. Partner partnership to End Homelessness, there's one. Uh, school Joints, I've got that one already. Strategic Communications Committee, there are two positions. That's on page seven. Upper Noose, uh, where Commissioner McKee was just talking about, there's two positions there. And the Workforce Development Board um, has, Nancy Costin has um, mm -hmm. been going for us. Yeah, I would assume that, that we would want to keep that. We have that. one more position on, as an alternate for TARPO. I'm sorry, say that again? TARPO, right there at the top of page seven. TARPO Maybe. has one more. Oh, alternate. alternate, yeah. Position. Alternate, okay. Because right, Sally, you picked that. Yeah. Okay, so Commissioner Price, it is your turn. Okay. Um, Go Triangle Community Advisory Committee. I've only met twice so far. I'm sorry. Okay. Do what now? I'm sorry. Go Triangle go Community, Community Advisory. advisory. Okay. Um, and I'm going to go, I'm going to choose the, um, um, Chatham Orange Joint Planning Task Force. And that one is done then. And then 
Commissioner Markopoulos. The Durham Orange Chapel Hill work group. Okay. And Commissioner Green. Mm -hmm. um, Food Council. Okay, and then that one is done. Which one did you pick? Food Council. The five top one. <coughs> Commissioner Bedford. Uh, the Durham Orange Chapel Hill work group also. Okay. Where's that at? That's on page four, the fourth one down. So that's done now, right? That is yeah. done, right. Okay, and then we're going back to um, Me Commissioner, again? Ma Commissioner McKee. No, don't we go, I go back again. up. The, we I go, go back again. Up he goes again. I go oh, again. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, James Eddie. Yep. Um, the the Burlington Graham MPO advisory, and that's on page three. Okay. Would you like to be member or alternate? A uh, member, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Commissioner Green. Um, I'll do the upper news. Thank oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> upper news, and that's what's the page again on that? Seven. Page seven. Okay. <sighs> Commissioner Markopoulos. Oh, uh, let's see. Take the Jordan Lake One Water Association. Okay, and that's on page five, bottom one. Yep. Commission Dorson. <sighs> Let's see here. I'll take the. Uh, Let's see. I'll take the. Um, do something different here. Yeah. Um, let's see. When does uh, <coughs> this meet? Um, I'll take the uh, ham and a ham and a ham and a ham and a. <laughs> I'll take the. Um, I'll take the legislative issues working group again. Okay. And that was. That's on page uh, six. Six. Okay. And Commissioner Price? Uh, the legislative work issues work group. Okay. Which one? Legislative. And that one's done then. Okay. That's on page six. And mm. I'm going to take the JCPC, which is on. Hmm. Page six. Item both. And then Commissioner McKee, you got two coming at you. Uh, strategic communications work group. <coughs> Which one's that? I'm Strategic sorry? communications seven, second okay. one down. And then your second one? Yeah, I'm still hunting. Okay. Take your time. I'm going to pass. Okay. We got to pass. Commissioner Dorson? No, I'm going to pass as well. got to pass. Commissioner Price? I'm trying to get our new colleagues to take some more on. <laughs> uh, ABC board. Which one? ABC. ABC. Okay. Um, I'm going to do uh, the Go Triangle Special Tax Board. And then that one is done. Commissioner Markopoulos. Well, 
Wouldn't mind passing either. I got Pass. a pretty okay. full load here. Commissioner Green. Um, partnership to end homelessness. And then Commissioner Bradford, you got two coming at you. Um, the Orange County Partnership for Young Children. And that is there. Pa page okay. six. Yep. And, okay. There's not too much stuff There's left now. There's not too much left, yeah. Um, there was one with an alternate. The page is done. Uh, we have Healthy Carolinas. Oh, boy, that would be a hypocrite for me. Uh. <laughs> I don't think I can serve there. <laughs> Come on. Uh. Um, we also have the Intergovernmental Parks Work Group Alternative. Oh, okay. We're, that would be fun. Do you want to do that one? Yep. That sounds great. Okay. Okay. I'll be the alternate. There. So that one is done. Um, commissioner. Where, where is that at? That is on page oh. six, third one up. Okay. Earl, you have, have already chosen Page that five. one. Yeah. Commissioner Green, yeah. you have, you're five, up. Five, yeah, all the way down in the middle. Yeah, IP worker. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to pass. And there's a pass. Commissioner Markopoulos. Let's see here. I'm going to pass for now, too. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner Dorson, I'm taking it you're going to... So, no, let, let, just to be clear, what's left? Okay, so what's there's left? The, there's, is there is a Burlington MPO alternate? Is that still open? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This yeah. is yeah. my yes. notes okay. of what's yes. left. Mm -hmm. yeah. This Healthy Chatham Care. Orange, is that filled? That's filled. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Healthy Carolinas is open. And Strategic Communication, and strategic that's it, right? No, TARPO alternate. And the TARPO alternate. TARPO alternate. alternate's open. We have a TARPO alternate and a Upper News River alternate. And this, was there a second on the strategic communications also? Yeah. Second person. Well, I'll take the healthy Carolinians one. Okay. I could use the... Healthy? <laughs> the reminder. Yeah, the reminder. <laughs> okay, Commissioner yeah, yeah. Price. I'm going <coughs> to pass. Commissioner Price is going to pass. I'm going to do... Um, um, Upper news, if I can call in. Yeah, you can. Okay, and Commissioner McKee. We have, wait, what do we, let's see what we have left now. Is, do we have partnership to end homelessness, and when does that meet, that's and done. what time does that that's, meet? That got picked that, already. That picked already. Oh, okay, I that's missed all that. Done. The only thing that's left we, uh, is the strategic communication, to which, Commissioner McKee, you're already, you right. already chose that. Yes. TARPO alternate. And then the TARPO alternate. Burlington MPO. And the Burlington And Burlington MPO. Now, I'll tell you a suggestion. I was the TARPO rep this year. And I'm happy to be the alternate if you go most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right. my so, problem. So but one's you, already isn't one's one's, yeah. one's already picked. You, if, Sally if already you, picked it. Yeah. Right, but there's um but there's an alternate. There's an alternate. Were you, were you, did you, were you looking at me? Yeah, so of I could be I would, I would be I'll the go. alternate. Yes. And if you can't okay. go, I'll go. But I'll so, That's the deal. Okay. Stay in order. Where is it? Where Stay is in order. Take care of that one. We only have three left, so let's just grab them. So the so Tarpo is gonna go to Mark M. Um, right. So we need, we have one person left for um, uh, communications Burlington. and the Burlington MPO. Or do you want to swap? I'll do office? communications. Do Renee is going to do communications and oh, does anyone want to do Burlington MPO? That says alternate, right? Because there's yeah. somebody else on there, right? James Eddie, you're doing, you're, you're on. Oh, wait, no, wait there. a minute. No, we've got Earl and Mark Dorson on communications, right? No, I didn't pick no. communications. Oh, you didn't pick that one. No. Oh. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, we, we've got Commissioner Bedford on the Burlington Graham MPO. We need an alternate. <coughs> Who would like to do that? That's the only thing we have left. No one? I, I'll do it, but I don't. I have a very hard time getting from the projects there. Okay. And a lot of times it also seems like invariably those meetings conflict with our meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are two C's at five. Yeah, you have to. You can make the drive if you go really fast from, from Burlington <laughs> down, down to here. Apparently they my, serve my good problem dinner. Is, my problem will be getting from Kerry to Burlington. Yeah. yeah. So, you have to know when to leave. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. So is he going to you got, Make sure James Bishop goes on me. No, I think we're the alternate. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. 
Alternate. I think that's it then, right? Mm -hmm. I thought they said. Um, so, um, Donna, how would you like us to handle this? We start our meetings in January, and then we're going to vote. I have already gotten the emails written. I'm just going to plug in the names okay. to all the support Please. staff. Okay. That, and a lot of these are external boards, intergovernmental right. boards. So I will give them your contact information, whether it's one member or two members, and they will, they have already know that they're to contact you with your meeting calendars, any other pertinent information that you may need, you may need et cetera, et cetera. And I will copy you when I send out those emails to each of these boards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So that and you can see the support staff that's on the board so they can contact you. And so I'll probably do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when we come back in our first meeting in January, we're going to vote on the Well, we'll you vote can vote tonight. In. This is a regular meeting. So if you want to go ahead and look at it, I mean, do it tonight. Um, I can send it out, you know, at, after the holidays and that you look at it to make sure. But we have three people taking notes here tonight, all taking them. So, um, so how does the board feel about voting on this tonight? Yeah, let's do it. Why don't we just read? Why don't we just have someone read the list from the yeah. in down from the top and okay. make sure we make sure I wrote down everything I'm supposed to do. <laughs> okay. Um, does that sound okay, Donna? Do you want to yeah, go would, ahead and read that, that list? That would be great for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to go ahead? Please. Okay. ABC Board Renee Price, Board of Health Earl McKee, Board of Social Services James Seta Bedford, uh, Central Community. Committee, which is, I have its community oversight board, James Seta Bedford, Burlington Graham MPO, the member is James Seta Bedford, uh, uh, the alternate is Earl McKee, Chatham Orange Joint Planning Task Force, Renee Price, Penny Rich, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, Earl McKee, uh, Community Home Trust, Earl McKee, uh, MPO, Renee Price member, Penny Rich alternate. Durham Orange Chapel Hill Work Group, Mark McCopolis, James Seta Bedford. Durham Tech Board of Trustees, Mark McCopolis. Family Success Alliance, Renee Price and Mark McCopolis. Fire Chiefs Association, Mark Dorson. Food Council, Sally Green. Go Triangle Board of Trustees, Mark McCopolis. Go Triangle Special Tax Board, Renee Price and Penny Rich. And that will be meeting, I think, the second week in January. I just got an yeah. email, so I'll yeah. We'll copy all on that one. Go Triangle Community Advisory Committee, Renee Price, Healthy Carolinians, Mark Dorson, Orange County Local Government Affordable Housing Collaborative, Mark Dorson, IP Work Group, Earl McKee member, James James Seta Bedford alternate, uh, Public Safety Training Facility, Earl McKee, Mark Dorson, Jordan Lake One Water Association, Mark McCopolis, Justice Advisory Council, Mark Dorson, Sally Green. JCPC, Penny Rich, Legislative Issues Work Group, Mark Dorson and Renee Price. Uh, in North South BRT, Mark Dorson. Partnership for Young Children, James Seta Bedford. Partnership to End Homelessness, Sally Green. Uh, Small Business Loan Program, James Seta Bedford. SWAG, Penny Rich and Mark McCopolis. Strategic Communications Work Group, Earl McKee and Renee Price. TARPO, Sally Green member, Mark McCopolis, alternate. TJ Cog, Sally Green member, Penny Rich alternate. Upper News River, Sally Green member, Penny Rich alternate, and possibility of calling in. Hmm. Um, it's the Workforce Development, Nancy Costin, Visitors Bureau, Penny Rich. Sounds good. Do I have a motion to approve? Good so move. moved. Dorson and uh, Price, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Nice. Well done, Miss Chair. Well done. I was sweating that Easy. one. I was sweating. Chair, Chair Rich, can I yes, just sir. say something real quick? Please. So following up on what you were talking about before we did this, I think we can improve this process because what we did last year is we had the goal of making sure that no one was on a committee as like a lifetime appointment and, right. and no one else got onto that committee. So we made that happen. We, we made it so that that's not going to happen anymore. We acknowledged by saying that, it, you know, you can be on an in, in, intergovernmental committee for two years and an intra, no, the reverse, intra-governmental committee for two years and an inter for four years, thus acknowledging the value of learning how that committee works and developing relationships and representing the county better. But we didn't, we didn't uh, formalize in any way, uh, any procedures to make that happen. So you have people that have served on a board for a year and they're just getting 
you know, their sea legs, and then it's gone, right? So I think we just need to talk about this. I'm, I have some ideas, but I think we need to, at a work session or something, figure out how do we uh, make the most of our, the, uh, the power that we as a board have by putting the right people in these very important positions and part of that is allowing for the, uh, the, the person to stay in a, a position for more than a year. So that, that learning time is not wasted. I think it makes us stronger as a team if we can figure out a way to do that. All right, well, we can, we can add that to um, an upcoming work session in the next couple of months. I was thinking about this also, and, and I agree with you, and I also think that um, you can have someone on a board for two years and then no one else on the board wants to take that, does that person then, then again uh, able to take that board? So we, we didn't really iron out all the sort yeah. of issues that can happen with it. So I think that's right. And, and that's why, you know, it, it, the policy and the procedure didn't really follow some of the things that we were talking about. And uh, what we talked about this in, a, in our last agenda review when Commissioner Dorson was there as well. Um, so I, I do think we should revisit it and just fine tune it. And make we sure that, that we because get this it right. process was brought was that the process that was listed in your app was brought back to y'all last March and approved, or right? Sometime, yeah, it was approved as part of uh, when we did all our boards and commissions last year. But I definitely agree. I think the conversation needs to be had again yeah. to maybe iron out like some of the wrinkles and answer questions, especially with two new commissioners on the board. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Dorson. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just you know want to reiterate that I think that. Um, you know, just going, having gone through this process, I think we honored what we tried to do. I, I, I tend to disagree with the idea that, that any of us should become, you know, the experts in one area to the, you know, or the idea that there's, some of us are better suited to being on some of these boards than others. I mean, I think we all have interest in them. And I think we also recognize what, the idea of having a year or two years. I mean, if you look, if you looked at this list that we just did, lots of people got continued on boards that they had and so um, but I you know I continue to believe that we create the strongest board by continuing to all serve in different in in different capacities whenever possible and to understand you know how those thing how each thing works um, so I, you know I I would just say I'm happy to continue the conversation have a work session but I would I would not support the idea of somebody getting a two-year term or a four-year term to any board have that discussion. Um, thank you all. I appreciate your patience with me on that. Um, so there are no reports. Seven, let's go to eight to the consent agenda. Does anyone want to pull anything? Um, I'm not sure. I want, I want, yes, I want to pull the, uh, the um, which, which number is it? It's the one that I noticed that Johnny Randall, the Botanical Garden, is, is here. And I just want to acknowledge that, that um, the um, What's it called? The program to to not spray herbicides in the roadbeds. Okay, and that's um, let's see. It, it's D roadside of, of management. Yeah. Is that it? Yes. Okay. And do you want to make motion to approve the rest of the agenda, the consent agenda? Uh, so moved. Yes. Okay. Second. Second. So we've got uh, Green and uh, Bedford. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. And Sally. I'm sorry, Commissioner Green. Take it away. Um, first, I have to find where 8D is here. It's okay, great. D. Okay. This is about adopting best management practices for roadsides and utility rights of way to benefit pollinators and native plants in Orange County. And my understanding, just simple, um, if nothing else, just from looking at the agenda item, is that this has been a discussion that's gone on for a long time. And um, if, if you're interested, Johnny, I'd like to invite you up to say something about it. Mr. Randall, why don't you join us? You were just relaxing back there, huh? <laughs> well, I just came to enjoy the show. <laughs> but I thank you all for this. It's something that I have had great interest in, as well as many others, for a long time. This is, a, I think, a really important thing um, that Orange County is doing. And you can and are taking a leadership role in this particular concept of um, recognizing that uh, our road signs and rights of way 
harbor a uh, tremendous amount of biological diversity. And hopefully this can be a model that other counties and the entire state of North Carolina might follow. So thank you for doing this. Thank you, Johnny. I remember when I talked to you about this, you explained that um, it just happens that um, wildflowers tend to start in the roadbeds, and, and so if you if you kill them in the roadbeds, they're not ever going to be out in the main fields. In other words, they they start at the margins and then go to the mainstream. And I think that's a nice metaphor for a lot of ideas that start at the margins and go to the mainstream. So, okay. and the Commission for the Environment, the current Commission for the Environment, uh, deserves great thanks too because they. Uh, got this rolling again. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Price? Yeah, and I want to thank you for sticking with us because I, I know it goes way back and when we worked on it together and, and you were the spearhead of, of the whole thing with the pilot project and everything. So thank you for continuing okay. to do this. Commissioner Markopoulos. Is it difficult to work with the utility companies on this? Um, uh. I think yes, it is. Uh -huh. um, and so Department of Transportation does uh, mostly mowing still, but just adjacent to roadsides are the, uh, uh, the power lines. And so one section is getting sprayed with herbicides, the other section's being mown. Um, so, but I look forward to having these discussions with utility companies and, and determining a, um, you know, an economical and a, a mutually beneficial way to make this happen. The reason I brought that up is a, a, a resident who lives outside Hillsboro called me up a few weeks ago and talked about the Duke Energy sprayers right on the edge of her farm. She was pretty concerned about it. They were working along the road and the, you know, the power line easement. So mm -hmm. something that we need to make clear to the utilities every chance we get. Yeah. <clears throat> and a lot of this is contracted out and so um, I, I think the utilities perhaps have, as, have less control than we might think they do over what's happening. Commissioner Price? I know years ago, back in the 1990s, you could call uh, the utility companies to write a letter and request that they not use any pesticides <coughs> or herbicides on, you know, on your, your land. On your land yeah, or, but or not your, adjacent, yeah. Or in front of it, but no, yep. not adjacent, yeah. yeah. But then again, that was 20 years ago, so I don't know what their policy is right. now. I think it might still be similar, but then you have to make arrangements for controlling that woody vegetation um, yeah. that they need to control. Thank you for being here, Johnny. I appreciate right. it. Thank you. Okay, and Commissioner Green, do you want to um, move this? Uh, I'll move item 8D. Okay. Second. Uh, Green and McKee, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that passes. Um, county manager report. You've got Thank an you, Mayor. Not till 11. We're on manager's report now. Oh, I'm sorry. My no apologies. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and County Commissioners. Um, the only thing that I really have to report tonight is I'd bring your attention to um, the information items. There is an information item on there, Memorandum Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment Clarifying Enforcement of Nutrient Standards. If you may recall, this is something that has come to you as an abstract and you have approved going forward, approved the planning department to go forward in this process in consultation with the county attorney and um, just in trying to alleviate confusion amongst your constituents. We feel, I feel that, and I'm recommending that we have it under information items because what's happened in the past is we've had it as an abstract and um, constituents show up, they think that it's happening and that we're doing this. This is just to inform the board that they're going forward with this item as a text amendment. It does not say that they have a have completed it or are making a recommendation at this time. And so you will see these under um, information items and if there's any um, ones that are of great interest that I think I need to draw to your attention, I will do that. Also, if you see them and you have questions, you can certainly feel free to contact me or the planning director and we'll give you more information on those items. That concludes my report this evening. Thank you. Questions for the manager? <coughs> okay. Oh, um, there is one. Oh. I am so sorry. This is embarrassing. Um, someone who I should have 
brought forward much earlier and who has sat through this entire meeting is our new um, child support director. And I'd like um, Eric to, Erica to come up and um, just say a few words to the commissioners. We, um, I appointed her. She went through a um, competitive process. She has been the interim. She has a number of years of experience. She came to us from um, Person County. This is, um, Erica is a result of um, her predecessor who put in a, um, a succession plan um, a couple years before she left to make sure that there'd be someone as interim. And um, of course, Erica Rose to the top. She is the cream of the crop in uh, child support services and we're very proud to have her as our new child support director and I wanted to introduce her to you all and to everyone who's watching at 940 at night. <laughs> Welcome Erica. Do you, would you like to say hi to us and you know tell us what a lovely meeting we were having? And <laughs> yeah, it's a very interesting meeting. Um, I look forward to working with each of you. I did get a chance to speak with Commissioner Bedford last week. I did enjoy that. I look forward to rescheduling with Commissioner Green, and <coughs> I just look forward to working with each of you. And thank you for sticking it out. You're, you're no a sport. Problem. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. You. Sorry. OK. Um, County Attorney's Report. Uh, just, just briefly, um, in addition to the um, well-reported bills that the General Assembly's passed, uh, elections and uh, voter ID. They also uh, revisited some statutory uh, requirements and technical aspects in a technical corrections bill, and that impacts local governments. Um, it, one of the things they did was eliminate uh, the requirement for cable telecom services to provide uh, evidence and maps of how many households they skip over in their service areas. Uh, they say the Republican legislator who pushed that uh, indicated that in the long the upcoming long session they will uh, put forward a bill that will replace that and, and be better than, than what was being used. Um, that obviously remains to be seen. Uh, they clarified that local governments cannot require new or increased stormwater controls for pre-existing developments and that that has to go in uh, stormwater ordinances. And uh, they further restricted town's ability to impose fees for the review of small cell applications. So um, I think that's about it for what they did for local government. And, and I'm, the uh, association and the league don't think there are going to be any more bills coming out of them um, other than some vetoes, uh, veto overrides. So. Uh, hopefully they'll go home and, and won't do any more damage. That, that technical corrections bill hasn't been signed yet, though, has it, by the governor? That's correct. It's been ratified by both houses, but it is waiting for the governor to sign. You feel like it's not going to sign it? Be well, there's some controversial stuff in there about municipal charter schools and the innovative school district and some other things. So there's a... There's some mm -hmm. things that I think he likes, and there's some things he doesn't like, and so. Mm. We'll see. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, let's move to um, 11A, and this is the appointment for the Commission for the <coughs> Environment. And I had a question before we started on this, Ms. Baker, maybe you can help me. It says that there are four positions there and then um, there would be none left after we filled those four, yet when you look at the board and commission members, um, number three is vacant. And I just noticed that today when I went back and that reviewed probably, it. Yeah, that was an oversight. I will have Tom correct that. So. so number three would remain vacant. We should we we could go back to the commission for the environment and ask them if they have a recommendation for that, okay. or w was that just an oversight? You think in general? Cancel back there. Is there? I think uh -oh, it's conference. I think we need to put back there. I think we need to caucus and figure out what, what it uh, okay. actually needs okay. to be done there. So, so do you want us to vote? Excuse me. Do you want us to vote on the um, the four recommended uh, folks that yes, came within those. the letter, and then we can bring the the uh, vacant position number three back um, in January? Would that be easier? That would be ideal. So you don't have to caucus now. Okay. 
Is that okay? That, that would okay. be good. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Price. There's a letter from Tom Davis that says that there would be two vacancies. Okay. This said, this has one Me? vacancy open on, on, on vacant number C3. I know. I'm just referring to the letter that he put in here. One one person with expertise in land resources and one in water resources, and they're rec they do not recommend appointing at this time any of the current I think Bill Kaiser is rolling off the board. He did. Correct. That's true. He's still on there, and he's still on there till December 31st. So I that see. Okay, so that's the confusion. Going okay. We have not oh, taken yeah. because he's still been on there till the end of December. Okay, so let's just vote on the four tonight, and then we can come back in January for the um, yeah. additional. Yeah, so do I have a motion for suggestions? I move James Eichel for position 12, Matt Crook for position 13, Lynn Gronbach for position 14, and Bradley Saul for position 15. Second. Okay, we have Dorson and Mark Coplis. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that is going to pass. And now we need to go into closed session. This is to discuss the county's position and to instruct the county manager and county attorney on the negotiating position regarding terms of a contract to purchase real property, NCGS 143-3. 1 18.11A5 to dis discuss matters related to the location or expansion of industries or other businesses in the area served by the public body, including agreement on a tentative list of economic development incentives that may be offered by the public body negotiations, NCGS 143-318.11A4. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? Moved. Second. McKee and um, Dorson, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, everybody, we'll meet you in the back.